Hello and welcome to episode 10 of The Scumbag. I'm here with Felix Biederman as ever. Hello everybody. So today we're discussing the various levels of relationships online where you've got your cliquey friend groups, you've got your people talking about their sex lives publicly on Facebook, on Twitter. On Twitter sometimes it's a little more performative and we'll get to that certainly. And of course, Felix's deep and eternal love for Lena Dunham. Is our friend Bronze Hammer, Jesse says Lena Dunham. <laughs> I d- I don't, I, and I think the, I think that that she she definitely started a movement as well. She definitely started a movement about grossly oversharing the contents of your life for no fucking good reason. Now I do take that back for a second. That could have started earlier with Sex and the Sea, and probably with if anyone did any research, they could probably uh, counter my experience here. But maybe Sex and the City a little bit. But- it, it, it actually it started with Seinfeld, actually. Eh. What's yeah, the you deal? remember the episode where, yeah, Jerry was like, I shit on my balls. <laughs> I was getting a blowjob in a bedpan. <laughs> and Kramer was like, what? So I went out, right? And this girl, she uh, pissed on me. She pissed, she pissed right in my hey. hair. And then I called her the N-word. Oh, you don't hey, like that. Hey, Jerry, uh, the races shouldn't mix. <laughs> That was a weird episode. I don't know why they ran that one. I guess the 90s, you could just do anything in the 90s before all this social justice stuff. I really would love it if there was a bizarre episode of Seinfeld where it just went completely weird. Like like, like the episode of Pokemon they had to ban because it gave kids seizures. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that... I mean, there has to be because when I was a kid, I remember Seinfeld being on almost every hour. Yeah. Like there was a new Seinfeld every well, hour. And I could never, there were only two episodes of The Simpsons on every week, but there were 8,000 episodes of Seinfeld, and they were all, like, they all seemed the same to me because I was a kid. Like, well, the, I think it may have briefly made me, like, self-hating of, of Jewish people. Yeah. Maybe, I, like, a little bit, just because I wanted I wanted to watch The Simpsons, and, uh... And the- you know that's how they that's how they get you. That's well, how they get you. That's how like they made Hitler anti Semitic. Well, there was the episode where by... Kramer murdered a rabbi. That was kind of Kramer weird. murdered a rabbi. Kramer joins the Klan. <laughs> Kramer writes that Kramer busted McVeigh out of prison. That was a weird episode, and it also happened in real life. It was a case of life imitating art. And let's not get too off topic here. But if Seinfeld real life did actually fucking exist, Kramer would be like. Like, like a really weird alt-right dude and he'd be constantly into like bitcoin and rambling about the gold standard <laughs> yeah kramer kramer would constantly be going into jerry's apartment and be like jerry i don't think russians are white jeff like hillary clinton right she she started uh she she, she she's got dementia and that they would be kramer hillary doesn't have aids <laughs> Oh god, I, I would actually watch that, but I think it would be you, me, and maybe fifteen other people that watched it. Well, yeah, I mean, like, the, how many how many people bought the Velvet Underground's albums? Like, like probably like ten thousand people. That's yeah. it. But they grew to be influential. But however, there would be fifteen thousand articles a day on it because I truly believe that when people write about things, they don't actually watch the content. That's why I wrote my twenty nine thousand word. Uh, review of the Lady Ghostbusters movie. Yeah, no, I'm like, I'm sick of Lady Ghostbusters. I'm sick of, uh, they're going to do an all-female reboot of Black Hawk Down. I'm not happy about that. Are they that. seriously doing that? Uh, and they're going to do an all, all-female, all but also all-racist reboot of Seinfeld. <sighs> I was so, I was... Uh, it's a compromise. It's a compromise. I was so excited because I thought for a second they were really doing an all-female reboot of Black Hawk Down. That would be, I would like really laugh if they did it. Uh, well, I mean, because I, uh, but the stolen valor pages that I follow on Facebook would be lit. But let's wrap this back into relationships because the all female Ghostbusters thing was part of this very bizarre discussion of gender, sex, and so on and so forth on Twitter. Relationships, sex, your sex life, your whatever life. And you've got this situation where it's like you have to discuss these issues or you have to at least be. Depending on your friend group, you have to have a fairly, like, at least up-to-date understanding of certain things. Like, I imagine walking down the street, and this is not an attack on anyone who's 
non-binary gender, who is transgender at all. But, like, I don't think the average person has anywhere near the level of understanding that is expected of some people on Twitter. Have you noticed that? It's a bit weird. The alt-right people are more afraid of, I think, like, black people coming into bathrooms, whereas uh, it's, like, the Ted Cruz, like, religious people who are more afraid of trans people in bath. All politics is bathroom now. Like, it's all bathroom. It's all related to what you want to happen or don't happen in a bathroom. It's it's really weird, though, and it's it's this platform. And we were discussing Lena Dunham earlier in, in, our, in our worthless lives. In as the, we do every day, as me do. and Ed just, we have, we have an iMessage chat, but we have a special one, an encrypted chat, a PGP chat for Lena yeah, Dunham. Yeah, because our takes are too hot for the public. And, but, the, but yeah. she was really when I started noticing again, and you're remark, remarking on this as well, that she was the one who really started up, or at least really started people like discussing their weird sexual moments. Like I cra- I like the other day I crept on dudes balls or in like the episode of girls where Shiri Appleby best known for being the like cutesy, very nice and kind of naive girl from Roswell viciously was like pretty much sexually assaulted by Adam driver. And Hey, uh, but Lena Dunham is brave for, Bringing stuff to the forefront. I don't know. Like, I feel like that was when I started seeing a lot of quote unquote brave people discussing their lives. Quote unquote. Definitely did happen when that guy definitely told you, hey, during sex, hey, can I check my Pokemon Go or whatever. Well, that's like a lot of the episodes of like, I think when girls, I first want to say that uh, I feel compelled to defend Lena Dunham sometimes because like, people who voted for Marco Rubio and like believe in Marco Rubio, even though he looks like he's going to cry all the time, hate Lena Dunham. Like they think that Lee, they think that like they're losing a culture war because of Lena Dunham, uh, because of all the episodes of her show where Lena Dunham is like, God, I lost a Chipotle burrito in my (laughs) asshole. And, uh, so I feel compelled to defend her from those dorks. Uh, they think that Lena Dunham is destroying Western civilization, and if the show Girls is destroying Western civilization, first of all, not that many people get HBO. I can afford it, and I don't even get it, just because, like, I don't... I'm I'm proving some point, which I haven't decided what it is yet, by not getting HBO. But uh, if that could destroy Western civilization, like, a fucking strong gust would have bowled it over. I don't think it's, like, worth saving you're not going to save it if that's all you're up against. But uh, also, Lena Dunham, like, she didn't, like, make the show Girls because she sucks. Uh, she's, like, a good writer and shit. But I think they, she got a big reaction by, like, having a few episodes where, I don't know, like, she, you know, like, well, whatever happens in that show where she, like, fucks a guy and, like, takes his shit on him by accident. And people were like, that's so brave. Like, that's so courageous because... Women are expected to be perfect in TV shows, and Lena Dunham is having diarrhea <laughs> on a man, and that's well, there real. There is an episode that's where so she. Real. There is an episode, a really weird episode. I watched like the first two seasons. It wasn't a bad show, or wasn't is. No, it's like well written and like fun really to watch, engaging. And honestly, I do give a great deal of credit to them to actually popularizing Adam Driver because he was fucking great in Star Wars. But I feel like there's weird shit like. Like she like crawls ac- like he's like crawl to me and he like she like crawls across the floor and I did read something at the time where I was like okay wait what and it's like she was brave for showing that because that's what really happens in bedrooms you know a completely unverifiable statement of any kind at any point like how do you verify that that's what happens in bedrooms most bedrooms I'm guessing are like five minutes of sex and then both people on their phones. Well, me, you know, just speaking personally, I like about good seven and a half hours of foreplay. (laughs) You know, obviously breaks, then you add in breaks for urination. That brings us to about eight hours of foreplay. Uh, Exactly 17 minutes of penetration (laughs) from one position, which is lying down missionary, and I don't come. Yeah, mine it. And there's no pooping, no pooping, absolutely none. I'm not even coming. You think I'm gonna poop? <laughs> Get out of here. Get real. This isn't this isn't a fucking charity, right? That stuff's valuable. Yeah. 
Oh, uh, well, wow, wow, you're you're coming in your bed. Wow, real mature. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's 2016, and I'm gonna let more than two fluids go while we have a water crisis <laughs> and uh, there's war in the Middle East and Africa. You know, it's just like all the stuff is going on in Africa. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. No, but, uh, dry but seriously boys. though, I couldn't imagine even two years ago. Having, like, not this conversation, because we always have had these kinds of conversations, but the weird fucking shit I'm reading now on people's Twitter, like, there's, like, like, there's good stuff, like, people being like, okay, we need to actually talk about sex workers, that's great, let's talk about that, that's something that needs to happen, and then you've got people like, the time I had sex with my boyfriend, and I let him lick my eye, <laughs> like, and you're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> like, do I need to know? Well, I think that's, like... That's a clear economic consequence of Lena Dunham where people are like, yeah, I should talk about the time that uh, my fucking, my boyfriend like rubbed his, put his balls in my armpit and I made the armpit (laughs) farting noise and his, and, and our cousin was in the room. (laughs) My my boyfriend pulled up his, his testicles and said, Mickey Mouse. (laughs) My boyfriend wrote like, Cut off all his pubes and wrote my name. <laughs> oh, that's just. Sweet. I mean, this, these aren't like too much weirder than this actual stuff, like the woman who made bread from yeast from her vagina. And that's, but that falls into the category of just now the internet is here. We hear about everything for better or for worse, including such as my, which isn't actually my shit of the week, but related to Lena Dunham. The reason that people are talking about her today, as we record this show, is that Odell Beckham Jr., who is a football player. For the uh, New New York Gaints, as they're known. Um, apparently, she told... She was telling a story about him. She said, I was sitting next to Odell Beckham Jr. And it was so amazing because it was like he looked at me and he determined I was not the shape of a woman by his standards. He was like, that's a marshmallow. That's a child. That's a dog. It wasn't just me. And he just seemed confused. Did he say these words? No. I, is it possible he just looked at her and went, oh, fuck, it's Lena Dunham. Oh god, don't 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 fucking talk to it, don't say anything. Like also, it's just this weird, like, that's part of a wider discussion as well of different like it's fine to love the skin you're in and all that. Like, whatever weight you are, fine, whatever, like be yourself, like Chris Cornell once sung. But it's this weird thing where it's like, this is a story only because she added this shit about a shape of the woman by his standards. If Odell Beckham Jr. was like, uh, Lena, yeah, I uh, just, just wanted you to know that uh, you look like a marshmallow, you're a child, you're a dog, and you're uh, yeah. not the shape of a woman by my standards. I love your I love your jock voice, by well, the way. he's also, like, a big black dude, so, like, if I can think of no one... Like, put me in pain and hit inverse, and it's Odell Beckham Jr., like a hunky, <laughs> tall, black dude. <laughs> Is you could actually do that when you made a character in Tony Hawk Underground, <laughs> and it's so you, that is yeah, it's like inverse Ed. It, it's Odell Beckham Jr. But seriously though, it's like if you remove any of like the shit of like, like all this was was Odell Beckham Jr. was like uh, it, or just like possibly looked over and saw a person. There's a high chance he had no idea who she was. But this is all part of a culture. This also, part- sometimes, also, sometimes you're like not horny. Sometimes, like you, I know it's shocking, but like just sometimes you don't want to fuck. And also, uh, Lena Dunham had also called him it during this. And uh, there is like there's like a weird class and race thing where it's like the way that some white people talk about black men as sex objects. And it's also funny as well. And it's it's it, she's. It, well, she sounded very like Elliot Roger. Yeah, like she sounded like he Odell Beckham. Oh, no one owes you sex. Like it's not. But that's exactly. It's what, one thing to like. Ooh, yeah, that's exactly what people are saying. That, that a very common and true thing, which is like, and it's always the guy clap, don't clap, I don't clap, oh clap, tap clap, you sex. Like, but this is exactly it. Like, what is what's her fucking like point here? Because this is this is. I'm not going to like like turn this into suddenly like the alt right podcast where we say women are bad but it's like this thing is just the direct this is like the direct hypocrisy and she's definitely I I assume at some point she said girls don't owe guys sex but I feel like this is like like this is that this is that for women like maybe he just doesn't find you attractive maybe he was just tired 
Maybe he just looked over and was like, I don't want a fucking conversation. Maybe he doesn't want to have a conversation with someone if he knew who she was and had anything that is going to say shit like this based on what may have been two or three glances. Yeah, it seems like he she already made a conversation for them. Yeah. Uh, I'm Lena Dunham for this tweet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. But, um, but, but back to relationships in general, though. So on Twitter as well, you'll occasionally get these people who have this really that this weird thing where they've got their private both their 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 spouse on there and their friends and some of them are like private accounts it's like in their profile it's like madly in love with jakarta lovely 420 and that's a private account and he'll like quote things she says and you won't be able to see it because you're not following her and it's like why'd you do that mate did you forget that's, the, that's like bizarre behavior that's such bizarre behavior when uh people like people post some people do have like legitimately fun and like cute relationships where they're both the people are funny but most people aren't and their inside jokes are just like a type of wine that they both like or some shit which is fine and they're always like linking to each other's tweets yeah it's fine it's like you can be lame like most people are lame and there's nothing wrong with that but it's also like just having it like just always forcing you to see it, always forcing you to be involved with it is a very internet thing, especially considering that like most of these end horribly. Oh God. Yeah. And that's like, holy what... shit. Do they end bad? Oh my God. It's just, I, and any relationship as well on like, I, I have an ex wife. I legally cannot talk badly of her, but the fact of the matter is I was fucking stupid enough within my, within that to have an account on like a back and forth and like quoting her and, like, there's a hashtag for my first fucking marriage. Like, my wedding. And it's like, oh, my Christ. That's there forever. Like, and that relationship is, well, I, I may have deleted a lot. But that's something that exists in this weird bubble where you'll see people talking about each other's banal activities. Like, ah, Joey went out today and he's been working out and he looks so good. And then randomly that person will then flip. And then be like, I'm so depressed today. It goes back to oversharing. But then the other person will tweet like, Jemima, she's just, she's being so depressed. She's so overweight. Jemima. <laughs> Jemima, Joey and Jemima, you know, <laughs> my good friends. <laughs> I don't know where I got those names. Just like everyone, I, I would, I think that'd be funny if everyone we knew was named after like racist food mascots. <laughs> I wasn't even thinking that. Am I like. Ben and, Je ben, ben, ben and Jemima. <laughs> <laughs> Oh God, we're getting this is the last episode of the scumbag of where we're fucking stabbed to death. Yeah, no, we're gonna they're like everything they say about Lena Dunham, they're gonna say about us after this episode. Yeah. Well, they're like, well, why was well. Ed's first name that he thought of Jemima? <laughs> yeah, it's just like I but what I like though, as well as that's exactly the same part of a brain that makes people think they need to tweet their fucking in jokes about their relationships because that like if they in their head they think it's like being intelligent but like it's not and in my case it people might read it as like oh he went for a racist name it's like no my friend was like name that begins with j name that begins with j jemima cool move on oh shit it's racist and yeah <laughs> which, which doesn't happen a lot thankfully I mean, like, most of our inside jokes are just, like, saying that we're racist, but not saying anything racist. Yeah, exactly. Just, like, being, like, we're racist. The racist banjo boys. Uh, but, but not, like, the depressing is weird, too, because you talked about this, where, like, one member of this couple will go, like, I'm really depressed today. But I just want to make an aside here. This is, like, the next thing I'm saying that people will yell at me for. You know how, like, those things on the... We've talked about this before, but you know how, like, things on the internet where people are like, uh, you should never tell somebody with depression to get over it. Well, like, I didn't used to think that you should do that before the internet. Now I absolutely think you should tell people with depression to get over it. Because, like, most of the people I see online who talk about their depression just need to, like, take a walk or something. Or like, if, it's not that bad. Or if they... And, and it comes back to, though... Exactly the same thing. You're so brave for talking about it. You're not fucking brave to say you're intent. You like to say you're depressed. Isn't it, you know what? I forgive the once or twice because I'm fucking guilty of it. 
I've had a shitty day, I'll, I might say it once. And you know what? There's definitely some part of my brain that just wants one person to be like, oh, it's okay, Ed. And it's stupid and childish. Everyone does it on some level. But when it's like part of your rep, your, your like performance on Twitter, when it's regular, when someone can search the word depressed with your name and it comes up, that's a problem. But what's funnier, I find with these couples is you'll see one of them being like, you know, I've just been crying all day. And like, it's just a real problem. I just, my depression's going crazy. Another one's like, walk in the dog. Time for work. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Isn't that weird when you see like, you sort of like, you see the mask slip and you see like the partner, the person that spends the most time with them while their partner is like, uh, I just, you know, I'm just, I'm depressed again for the 87th day in a row. And the partner is like, we're going to Benihana tonight. <laughs> and it's like, either the partner is just totally callous or they kind of know that their partner really isn't depressed. Just like kind of kind of bored and bored and directionless as we all get sometimes. Well, maybe it's one of two other things. One, they might really like the other person might really fucking hate Benihana. Or two, they're just so fucking used to the other person actually being depressed because when you're with a depressed person it's not like something that just disappears it's not like and that's why it really confuses me when people vent continuously about it because it's like this is making it worse but i guess that that it's the very human thing that creates many of these obtuse articles and tweets and such about like sharing your inner whatever's it's you think the like facing it head on is talking about it when facing it facing something head on not to get too pop psychological here is actually fucking facing it and thinking about it which is very quiet and incredibly painful and i hate yeah it's very solitary you don't really get to perform introspection no, in fact it's introspection maybe that's what they think it is though because it's like it's weird like i got told the other day by someone like Oh, you you you're engaged. Wait, you talk about it on Twitter. Uh, what, what am I meant to fucking say? Like, do you, am I meant to like keep an? Is there like a gauge? Like, like one of those things when you hit them hard enough and the the the, the weight goes up and hits the bell. Like, I have to talk about it enough for it to be real. Or maybe I just don't need to divulge every fucking detail of my shitty life. Like, I don't have to tell everyone about I'm engaged. This is happening. And then there are the people who's like every two fucking minutes. It's like, it's not even exciting stuff. It's not even like going dress shopping. It's like, well, we went and we looked at tablecloths. It's like, what? Who? Oh man, the worst is people getting ready for their weddings. That's shit. I hate it. I hate it so much. I'm doing it right now, and I've shared like I mean, I, nothing. I, I, I've shared nothing. <laughs> right, you shared nothing on Twitter. That's why, like, you know, uh. Like the people who like have like a theme wedding, like a, I mean, you are having a steampunk wedding. You've told me yeah. about it. You've told me a lot about yeah, it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a Zyborn clock theme. Yeah, yeah. Like I will be, you know, I'll be officiating the wedding as Johnny Five Aces and uh, Please, Felix, the other family. Ed and it. <laughs> but I, no, like I come from a long line of people that had shitty weddings. Not shitty weddings, but just like they didn't do anything. Yeah. Like my mom and dad just like went to got a civil Same ceremony. Here. My sister, yeah, my sister just got married. It was like at a restaurant in Chicago, not like a particularly great one, like a pretty good one. It is. Uh, it's like yeah, it's just like we're on like. Uh, I mean, my cousin had a huge fucking wedding, and God, I mean, in my immediate family, we're just like we're. Uh, we either we're either like weird anxious people. Uh, and don't want to plan that much, or we just like we don't care about it that much. But uh, I always, I always see like the people who are gonna get married, and they're like they're posting all like all the tablecloth and bullshit on their uh, on their feed, and it's like yeah, the the worst sensation you can get from following a couple on any type of social media is like that you're at a dinner party with them and can't fucking leave. Yes, and I think that this is really where you find Facebook and Twitter separate. Because you don't so often see, partly because it's impossible to track on Twitter with a feed of any more than, like, 20 people, 
But on Facebook, you are fucking shoved like right up the anus. You will see every shitty detail of their shitty fucking stupid lives. And then and then you'll get like someone like posting that they were on and i follow a lot of media people as well so i'll get like i just literally loaded up my feed just apropos of nothing and i saw two people were on television talking about like a subject they know like three things about and someone updating me about their wedding like that's facebook facebook is like inherent like the performance is different but it's a performance Twitter is like your show. It's almost like Facebook is there to prove you have an interesting life, but Twitter is there to narrate it. Yeah. I mean, I think that, uh, Facebook sort of lends its Twitter is weird because Twitter is more, it lends itself to people falling into these very weird subcultures mm-hmm. or they think that they're subcultures, but it's just them and their friends. Yeah. Uh, and the, yeah, like like when people are the I like I actually hate it when people are like oh, oh, oh sell a Twitter oh, oh, media Twitter. It's like no, this is just like you and like five other people you know. And I, no one gives a sh- like literally the rest of the website wouldn't notice if you died. No one would notice like not that many people would notice if I died no. because it's just like it's mostly me and my friends. Like that's mostly what Twitter is. But because you're because you're in a big pond. You think that you are, and you're constantly getting engaged. Yeah, uh, you're you're being engaged with stuff that you you you're a bigger part of this economy than you are, and you're really not. Like it doesn't matter. No one gives a shit about it. No one knows what happens on Twitter. No one cares. Not that many people are on it, but they think that they've identified this like language group or this big subculture, and. Yeah, I, I, it, it, it's just a, and they feel like obligated to share their life with them, like because oh god, I don't know what it is. Oh god, I know, and like, I mean, it's partly the platform's fault that you have to see some of this. Like, I'm looking at two people from Vice having what is one of the most banal conversations back and forth, and I'm not actually like mad at them for having it. I'm mad that Twitter is making me see it. Like, it's like, do I need to know the shit you say on Slack? No. And I'm sure occasionally I'll post this fucking silly thing I've said on Slack, sure. But that's not, like, I feel like, you talk about, like, media Twitter, for example. Now, you could break down these subcultures. If you're, like, sitting here thinking about it, you could say, there's media Twitter with these people, there's political media Twitter, there's these people. You could get them all together, and how many would there be? 150 of them. Let's say they have 20,000 people that care, that's still a drop in the fucking bucket of actual users of Twitter. And I'm sure if you removed every person of the media from Twitter, someone might notice. But if you halve them, I don't think so. Unless you got to the people who were like, oh my god, they're gone. Media Twitter removed. Like That's the weird thing, though, is that like the thing of media Twitter people posting screenshots in their Slack, like they're really... Which is just another platform to say things like big if true to each other. Uh, that they, uh, they're, uh, it's like following people in a relationship. And it's weird because they, it's the same exhibitionism and same trying to like show everybody your inside joke and think that it's funny. Uh, and, and that should be alarming if you act like that while you're like in a relationship with somebody that it's the, that's the say you're doing the same thing. And I really feel like Twitter, Ruin everyone used to say, Oh, this shit. I remember when Facebook finally was released to everyone. When Facebook left college and everyone got on Facebook, and there was the there were these hand wringing articles that went out about how Facebook's ruining relationships because of their like it's complicated or whatever, and all that. I would say Twitter has done so much more damage to relationships because you've seen the rise of people talking about it's not okay or it's okay to talk about selfies. It's Oh, hey, I can get an audience purely for posting selfies. Oh, hey, I can now talk about the term sex positivity. Whatever the fuck that means. I mean, I guess it means that it's okay to discuss sex or have it, which I mean is wrong. It isn't okay to have sex, but... No, 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 absolutely not. Volcel, baby. But seriously, though, it's... it's All this, day. It's this weird thing where 
people are now it, it, on one hand it's good because people discuss real issues on one hand it's so much worse because now you've got people who post like every day with a new fucking selfie every day with a new fucking update on their dating life every day about like like their eggs they, they, they had like a date with someone it wasn't a good date it was a bad date or oh this guy on tinder he said that he wanted to suck my papa's momo's sweetie and like all men must die or and then you've there's definitely a side of twitter that we don't see i guarantee there's the direct opposite of just the most vile fucking guys ever to like, yeah, I was banging this girl the other day. That's my drunk voice again, by the way. You know, that's a, that's what people say that I do. <laughs> like, uh, this, like, uh, Republican guy got really mad about Chapo Trap House this week, and he just, like, went on this rant about, uh, I don't know, he said brochalists. I mean, I feel like I'm the only whatever the fuck that is. Uh, but he was like, yeah, they're always like, oh, I'm going to bang this chick and get an abortion, bro. <laughs> what? <laughs> the most vile thing on yeah, Chapo. Yeah, yeah, The most vile thing I've heard on Chapo related to woman wasn't even vile. I think it was the discussion of Harley Quinn I heard just before being in a very bad car crash. Thanks for that, by the way, Chapo. Uh, was, it, I think all of you went, a wooga. Oh. Hubba, hubba. Well, like, that's, I mean, I do. Like the woman. I'm not like a bro misogynist. I'm like, yeah, I'm like a 1930s yeah, style exactly. misogynist in that, like, my heart beats out of my chest and my boner knocks stuff over and my eyes bulge out of my head and I run into a brick wall and flatten like a pancake yeah. uh, when I see a sexy I'm lady. A- That's not, yeah, I'm not a bro. I'm like an old school hobo. I'm all about stealing pies off the windowsill, getting horny at burlesque <laughs> shows. That's my shit, baby. I am strictly uh, an animaniac sexist. I... <laughs> I do nothing other than yell, hello, nurse, and then I'll get slapped and I'll have like a handprint in my face. (laughs) I hate it when, don't you hate it when you get horny and someone hits you on the head of the mallet and a lump immediately grows on it and like knocks your top hat off? (laughs) I hate it when that happens. I hate when that happens as well and you've got the little birds around your head for like three hours. It's so annoying. Uh, it's so when annoying. I get, like, especially when you have like business. Like when you're trying to get to work and like you get to a meeting, they're like, Ed. Why is there a big bulge on your head? And why is that? You said hello, nurse, again, didn't you? And I go, and I. <laughs> yeah, everyone knows you for it. And then I shrug, and it goes, bah, da, da, or something like that, like the theme song of my life plays. I can't be the only one who hates it when my enemy puts on a red dress and a blonde wig, and I get fooled into getting horny oh. for them. And then they uh, they blow me up with dynamite. I hate that. that. I really don't like it when that happens. The same thing happened to me the other day. One of my many enemies is dressed up like like an attractive broad, and um, I was wearing suspenders. And they went in for a kiss, and I was of course horny, so I went for said kiss. And they d- then I got so horny the suspenders actually undid themselves, revealing my underwear, which were large boxes with hearts on them, embarrassing me. In front of many oh, people. Oh, it's so embarrassing. I that feel when your bow tie spins around. <laughs> oh, that, that, but that really is the kind of horny I am. Like, 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 like ooh, no, yeah, that's ooh. me too. I just, I'm like, oh, hubba hubba. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but, but back to back uh, to why the conservatives are mad at you. I think. I don't know why they're mad at me. I don't know. I like. I got mad. I said some stuff. Uh, you know, I shouldn't like look at my phone for the first like probably. 12 hours of the day, yeah. I think. It's that- I don't know. I just, I, I, I see red. I like get mad some, a lot Which of Which is time. reasonable. And, uh, well, like this, like Catholic guy was like, Chapo Trap House is the same as Nazis. Which, you know, uh, I would like to point out there, you know, there are some few differences. You know, if I was being petty, I would say that Pope Pius uh, uh, was Hitler's best friend more than any leftist was ever, you know, if I was being petty about this type of thing, but I said some things that like offended some Catholic people, like some like traditional Catholic people that also like our show. And, uh, I don't know. It was a weird day for me. It was a weird day for me because I was back in the gym, but also like getting into this argument with people who have bios with Latin in them. Oh yeah. Like not a type of person I've usually known. Like my aunt is Catholic. My aunt is Catholic. She's from Ireland, but we've never had a conversation 
where she's like, you need to stop making fun of Michael Flannery, Doherty, Irish, you know, whatever. Like, uh, all these Google. guys have, like, eight names. Father. I'm not really, God, I'm really not helping my situation by, like, continuing to do this. But, you know, I am who I am. But uh, I know, I just, like, it was a weird thing. And, like, they were they were disappointed in me. They're like, I can't believe you'd stoop so low to make fun of this guy. And it's like, you, you were cheering, cheering us on when we like made fun of whoever before you're just mad because this, you share a group with this guy and he's an asshole anyway. Like if you're, if you're okay with people calling leftist Nazis, then like maybe you're not a leftist. Maybe you're Uh, a pretty fucking shitty Catholic as well. Yeah. Uh, but no, it was, I definitely, I definitely made the situation worse. Yeah, but that. I made the situation worse uh, by just like my shitty temper. Dude, I didn't I, have to respond to any of this, but I was just. I know nothing about shitty tempers. I, 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 I'm a calm yeah, I guy know. always. I know. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, I, it was just like no reason for me to do it. This is like most of my problems really are out of my own creation. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm exactly the same. Like I'm, I'm straight up. Like it's all you know. It always is. It's always like you respond to something that you could have just ignored. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> like forgotten about it in you an can. hour, but instead you're in this like three day death struggle where you're like, all right, I've got them circle. I'm fucking encircling them now, and then you get done with it, and it's not like you gained anything. You're just like that's that's now like, I'm angry and they're angry. You're. you're you're angry, they're angry, and it's also like you feel stupid because you're like, oh, that's like a completely useless episode of my life that I have to remember now. Like, that's a memory that I have to have. Just me, like, staring at my phone and being like, all right, fucking Randall, Doherty, Flannery, Connor, I fucking got you now, bitch. But prepare yourself. You and yeah, prepare yourself, bitch. And and then you the boom shakalaka moment you're expecting at the end is actually just a load of like dudes who support a guy who uh, to quote you looks like he's perpetually about to cry, um yeah, that's yeah yeah no so like the point is I'm 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 incredibly immature I'm incredibly immature, uh which which and, which, which uh, I feel like plays into this relationship and sex discussion though because as I was kind of I hinting at earlier. There is this level of understanding if you enter certain groups. So if you enter media, Twitter, if you enter these things, you have to be really sensitive to a point of almost obtusity to things like discussion of weight, discussion of gender, discussion of relationship types, the different terminology between them. And it's really like this. The Internet has enabled on one really good side people who are don't quite fit in a particular box to be themselves. That's wonderful. But it's also got this weird thing where it's like, I like you, like, I can't like, I can't say something like, Oh, look at that fat fuck. Because like, if I see like a large man on the street, it'll be like, don't, don't body shame the large, the large bearded man. And it's like, oh, Christ, like, I'm not going to go to some random girl, as people literally do on Twitter, and be like, you fat bitch, man. But it's like this weird thing where I got someone the other day who was like a friend of a friend responded and then deleted it when I was like, what the fuck? I think I said something about someone being fat or possibly like, like, like someone. I think I even said something innocuous to a friend like, I uh, maybe maybe you and I should work out, which is a quote from Akewood. And they were like, "Yeah, body shame much." It's like, what the f- no? I, I I can't. I saw that happen. I I saw something like that happen where uh, this guy was like to his friend, like, "You and me should work out. Like, we should get in shape." And it ended with the guy saying that calories aren't real <laughs> and that diabetes is made up by doctors to fat shame people. And I was like. That he's me. It's my new that's best friend. That's me. I'm a- and he's also my son. I'm actually really shocked. That's extremely I'm me. actually shocked that that guy didn't get fucking torn apart, though. Because that is exactly the kind of thing where... I'm not saying... This isn't about being PC. This is just... It is... It, you need to be sensitive to this shit. You do. There are people who are sensitive, and you can apologize, and that's something you should do. 
But conversely, also, like, there's this... I, I can't imagine how terrifying Twitter must be to, like, say you're some 22-year-old, you've not been on Twitter much, you get into the media, you jump in, and you're like, oh, yeah, look at that fat bastard across the street, and, like, 18 people, you know, like, I can't believe you're really like this. Like, they're not. I feel like Twitter is this amazing thing where, especially when it comes to issues like gender, of weight, of sex, like, it's so performative as to cover up your actual real personality traits, and that's why people get so angry at you and me. And I hide a shit ton of just horrible thoughts. Like, I would have, I have like 200,000 tweets, I'd have like 4 million if I put in every thought. Alright, yeah, like, I'm just, uh... On the count of three, let's say our worst thought that we haven't said on Twitter. Uh, I'll go, uh, one, two, three. This, they did nothing wrong in the I'm Spanish in in Inquisition. It was good. They should have done <laughs> two of them. Oh, <laughs> uh, we both went two different directions. I'm proud. I like that you always go. You go for the. You always go for the historical, and I just go for the immensely he- like homosexual. Like that, I'm secretly hiding. I'm gay. <laughs> like. But also, like, <laughs> I, I seriously, I think I, like, there's this long-running joke, the ver- the long and short of it, and we, of course, both know that Steve Jobs is gay. Like, he was gay. He is gay. That's not a joke, though. It's, it's true. true. But I gay. can't make that joke on Twitter, because it's this weird thing. It's not political correctness. It's just hypersensitivity towards, no, you can't say someone's gay who's not, because... If they're not gay, that's offensive to heterosexual people. It's like a fucking graph that you need to fit in with. Well, you know what people you know what people on Twitter love? They love it when they're like, Oh, I've always told you this guy was shitty, and then it's a screenshot of you of like someone saying something like that. And even that. They love like they love just like having their constant uh their constant finger wagging rewarded. And I That's people's favorite thing to tweet is like I told you, this guy should have died. <laughs> it's like, it's like me saying something like, uh, uh, I don't even know. Like I don't say anything that bad anymore. But I'm like, uh, like a screenshot of me being like, uh, there's only one gender. Or something. Yeah. <laughs> there's only one gender. Like, I told you he was a fucking piece of shit. I told you he was shit. I told you. I fucking told I feel you. Like the relationship economy but, to uh, give it a shitty startup style. Term cannot be more beautifully ironic. I'm not going to quote who said this, but you'll probably find them. Picture of psychology today with a pretty lady on it taking a picture of herself. And it says, The narcissist, it's not always who you think. And plus the connection to depression. And the other things are life lessons, 16 truths to embrace. It's on the cover of the magazine, the dark side of social media. And when your partner is transgender. And this person is saying, Your monthly reminder that, it, that this is not a real magazine about psychology. First of all, what the fuck? Yeah, like, none of that, I mean, that that's just, like, all bullshit, like, most of that's bullshit, where it's, uh, you can't diagnose somebody with narcissism by looking at their Twitter. That's stupid. Like, no actual psychologist oh, could do the, that. That's, the, like, that's, like, the... That's finger wagging. That's, like, a pseudoscience. It's finger wagging of the best kind. It is. Because it's, like, well, you know what? This isn't a real magazine about psychology. It's, like, it's psychology today. It's never been written as a scientific journal, which is what those are for. And at the same time, there were just as many, and I'm not naming who wrote it, because I'm pretty sure I've read their tweets and many other people's tweets, which try and do this obtuse, like, relationship psychology shit all the time. Like, what men are really thinking. This is what men are doing. This is what women are really thinking. And there are just, the, the guys are just not as eloquent at it, I think, the guys think that like there's definitely a higher intelligence with women to say things. That's why I would say there's more of it because guys are just like women are dumb, Gah. and then women come up with like intelligent sounding but not necessarily right things sometimes. Well, this is this is an episode of the Steve Harvey show I saw. It was uh, it was like it was like all the women were in the audience and all the men were on stage, and Steve Harvey was like, fellas. All the ladies are going to ask you the questions they've always wanted you to know, or always wanted to know, but have always been afraid to ask you. And the women would be like, why do you, like, why do all men cheat or something? Uh, and then it would, they would reverse it, and they would have the, 
men in the audience and the women on stage. And Steve Harvey would be like, fellas, you're going to ask the ladies a question. And the men would be like, why do you take so long to get ready? And everyone would laugh. Why well, I got to put the seat up? Yeah. I like, I, I actually think that Steve, the Steve Harvey show is better than psychology today. And you'll learn more about psychology by watching Steve Harvey. But I think that Twitter has, be- and he's smarter than all their writers. Yeah. I think he's smart. And like, it, like that analysis is smarter than like 99% of relationship fucking discussion on Twitter. And that's the weird thing though. I don't know why so many talk about it. And it's not like, I'm not even talking about the people who are just like, go like, duh, I had sex today. Or like, oh, guys with boners, shut up. But it's the people who have made it like their quote unquote brand to discuss every fucking detail of their fucking dating life or like how horny they are. Yeah. And it's just, oh God, I don't need to know that you're like sitting there, like thinking about like your crush and and it's no longer I used to think it was just like teenagers that did this. I up until maybe a year ago, I thought it was just teenagers that would like overshare to this extent. But I'm seeing people older than me. And I'm like, what whoa. Yeah, I see I see it from people like twice my age. <laughs> I, it's really o- o- odd behavior. It's like I think that my favorite thing is, like, when people just, like, bitch about, like, the shitty people they fuck, like, men and women, like, they just for, like, I've known them for, like, a year, and they're just always, like, if it's a guy, I'll be, like, it's another stupid chick who didn't know about socialism, no. <laughs> or if it's a, if it's a girl, it's, like, Oh, I, I fucked another guy who wears a snapback and he didn't call me, or like the ones, and they're both the just, like, like, who just wants to, like, sit on the couch Drink a beer and like, like watch P- like watch like Key and Peel and then fuck, and uh, then they get. That's such keep calm and chive on shit. Where you're like, I just want a girl I could sit down and walk, drink a beer with and fuck. There's, gu- there's girls that do it too, and it's like this this weird thing where it's like the discussion of sex online has created these the, the sweeties, the sweeties that you know and love, and then they're. I feel bad for them, but also. If you regularly, and there's many more women who do this, and there's many men that do it and then get surprised that women don't respond in the same way that men do. But I I, I'm sh- I, I am shocked when I see, like, female Twitter users. And I really need to stop saying female because it sounds weird. It's not how real people... That's always what I say. Whenever, whenever I, like, meet a woman, or even it's just, like, a woman, whenever it's a woman that I'm friends with, like, there are two or three of them in a the room, and I'm like, females, what's up? They like it. They like it. Like Excellent. They don't. Females are here. <laughs> but like, it's, it's <laughs> females. Listen up. It's 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 weird though because it's like I I see multiple people of both sides like do it, and I've seen guys try and do it. Like talk about like yeah, I'm horny. Like guys I know who have like used Twitter for like two minutes, and then they get no response. And they're like what the fuck. And then I've seen women do it, like, regularly talk about, like, uh, horny, or, like, oh, you want to talk about fucking? Yeah. And then they'll get, like, eight dudes being, like, sex right in your hoo-ha. And then they'll be, like, men. It's just kind of, like, yeah, sure, those people should be banned, but it's also a level of, like, uh, I don't know, it feels like you're magnetizing them. Maybe it's, like, a trap. Maybe we could like put a put like like a bunch of leaves and a hole underneath them. Yeah, the, yeah. I mean, like it's at a certain point if you've like only been dating like the same type of shitty people for a year, like maybe you are seeking them out. Yeah, <laughs> like, and it's it's it's. I and think it's, that's. I, I'm even worried. You know, you run. You. I'm even worried saying this though because it sounds like I'm saying yeah, guy like woman shouldn't talk about what they want to, but it's this weird thing where it's like, and it, I believe that I'm saying that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But it's like women can only talk about three things. Um, women can only talk about the Battle of Agincourt, uh, John, uh, the band Tool. Okay. And uh, and uh, the show Beast Wars. It's the only things I want to talk about with women. It's the only thing they can Man, talk I'll... about. It's not sexist. It's just like what I believe. I'm gonna have to dump my wife now because that's the woman I need. She doesn't know. Sorry, sh- she doesn't know shit about Beast Wars. Sh- but but you never talked to her about Beast Wars. <laughs> no, she's young. She just, I think it was before her time. But but if Steve if Steve Harvey was here in his like eighteen button suit, he'd be like, "That's a deal breaker, Ed." 
<laughs> um, and the audience to cheer. Uh, I should I should invite Steve Harvey to my wedding. But it's this weird thing where can you I, please? I'll email him. I assume it's Steve Harvey at gmail dot com. <laughs> Steve Harvey at Steve Harvey dot com. <laughs> probably is. But it's it's <laughs> it's this weird thing though that like the, the internet as 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 we want to do on the scabbag has created this open environment to talk about anything, which is. I used to think was just good, but now I'm reconsidering it just because it seems the bad is outweighing the good. But it's like created this thing where this self-fulfilling prophecy where women are allowed to talk about what they want, but sadly so are men. And like in defiance of said men who don't want, who want them to talk about sex, but also want them to do it on their terms the woman would keep talking about it. And so there's like this growing war and then the natural reaction of like, God, Twitter needs to do something about harassment. And it's like, oh Christ. Like in that case, yeah, Twitter, Twitter could do something about perhaps the guys like saying horrible sexual things, but, but the guys being like, oh yeah. <laughs> boy, boy, boy. And then the woman like two tweets later being like, oh God, man all up in my mentions again. What, what's with these horny guys? I used to follow this woman who would make like the most banal, like late nineties, uh, observations <laughs> where she would be like, uh, how come if a woman sleeps with a lot of guys, she's a slut. And if a man, blah, 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 you know, like stuff that everyone had thought about. Yeah. I don't know. I just like a nice, nice person, but it was also like, yeah, I've seen this observation literally millions of times. Uh, and of course, because she had a ton of followers, every time she would make one of these points, like fucking like Marine Gary 1962, like some fucking 50 year old man would be like, ah, oh, you women are supposed to be wives. <laughs> and uh, like, <laughs> just incoherent yelling, like, ah, I don't know, I think bras are too small now. I, I like the pointy brazilians. She would, yeah. Ah, well, women should dress like they're in the in the I got movie, a- the Winona R- Ryder movie where she's a witch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I don't disagree. They just fucking. Just, I, I, that's right. It's like kind of hot, you. actually. Yeah, it's me. That was me who said all those <laughs> things. Office. But uh, but it's those are all my alts. But, it's this- but they she would she would dot at she would dot at like all of them oh. like all like. Oh, uh, really? Really? Fucking Cardinals fan, Garrett, 1952? Uh, you actually, uh, you, you meant to come in my mentions giving me some actuallys? To the point where her timeline would be one Joker observation. It's like, uh, uh, how come men say that women should pay for dates but also don't want them to have careers yeah. or something? And then her, like, 87 dot ads in a row... Where it's like, oh, oh, re- oh, wow, really good point you made, fucking rifle Tom. <laughs> and it's <laughs> and uh, it, it was like, it was like, well, like maybe you're not like you, you're not like destroying them anymore. If your entire fucking like all your day is just like dot adding and performatively arguing with guys with like twelve followers who are who are like telling you to cover your hair or whatever and for both men and women and that i've seen i've seen dudes do it it's just a lot it, it's it's conversely less interesting but also less like infuriating where guys talk about like a shitty day it'll be like well that didn't go well it's just kind of sad or they'll be like yeah i can never find someone and on twitter i'd mostly be like ah look at that cry person but like uh, there there are a few women I know who are just like, every tweet is something about, oh, the fucking, and uh, the, 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 I went on a date and the guy was shitty, he's the, like rude guy. And it's one thing if like, that's part of your timeline. Of course, that's the same thing of anyone over talking about a subject. You like, sometimes I'll talk about one thing, sometimes I'll talk about other. By all means, like, let me know, I'm following you. I assume I won't like every tweet. Christ, if everyone liked every tweet I did, I'd be a billionaire. But it's this weird thing where it's like, if it's all you talk about, like you said, perhaps you need to date different guys. But also, um, like, maybe you don't, maybe you talking about it is some weird, like, what you consider introspection, but isn't. And there are guys, I actually, you know what, I just realized something. I do see guys doing this, but only on Facebook. 
It's guys who do this on Facebook. They'll go on Facebook and they're right. Yeah, yeah, guys who always bitch about women on Facebook. It's not like in the weird, like, sexist way you'd expect. And it's not like the misandrist bullshit, which isn't real, Christ. Um, it's more like, it's it's comparable to woman bitching about guys on Twitter, but it's usually long before we'll be like, I can't believe I can't find a girl. I went on a date the other day and the girl was just so fucking rude. I couldn't believe it. And it's just like, it just sucks. I can't find someone. And they usually don't discuss sex because, I don't know, I usually find like most guys don't discuss sex freely, like publicly, which is just, I think. I'm one of the only, I'm, I'm one of the only people who like openly, do, I'm like the man, Lena Dunham. But if, uh, because A, I have a lot of un- undeserved success. Uh, and B, I openly talk about my sexual foibles. And um, NFL players regularly ignore you. Yeah, all the time. Odell Beckham needs but to fill my hole, weight. or he's racist against me. Yeah, he's. I'm like, oh wait, you've never fucked a guy with a weird jawline and wide head. <laughs> You're racist, bitch. Uh, but <laughs> uh, I, I like I. So I think that like both of these are symptomatic of the same thing. Dating is like fucking humiliating. Caring about someone is fucking humiliating. It's like one of the worst feelings ever. It, one of the worst feelings is like when you put a bunch of mental energy into really want somebody wanting someone to like you and you think things are going well and then you just see them you they'll like fucking pop up somewhere having fun without you or you realize that you've been blown off or that being rejected by a person on a romantic or sexual basis sucks because we mystify these things yeah. so much we think that all sex is is part of love and says something about ourselves when really like sometimes people just aren't made to fuck each other if you some types of people aren't just supposed to fuck each other and it's all right but because it's like a deeply humiliating and tough thing to do no matter how old you are i think that the only way for a lot of people to take it back is to make this narrative that, like, hey, you know, either all the people I try to fuck or do fuck are stupid, or that I'm narrating this goofy, funny, madcap part of my life, when the truth is they're just kind of embarrassed and they're having a rough time. Yeah. Uh, many people and, are. That's and it's all right. the same thing with the girl who talks about having sex a lot or having bad dates a lot, and guys who talk about never getting laid or having lots of sex. It's all part of the same thing, like you said where the reality of it is probably far less interesting. And I feel like something grew out of the internet in the same way that WebMD has told like a million people that they had cancer when really they just farted. Like there are so many articles and the natural thing with any human is to crave a schemata for something that is chaotic. And really dating is fucking, I'd actually take it a step back from what you said Really, dating is a great deal of just fucking knocking your head against the wall. I can understand why a guy would be frustrated about a bunch of shitty dates and having to pay for them in the same way that I could understand a woman going on a bunch of dates and having a bunch of shitty guys pay for them and expect something from it. And both parties just fucking knocking their heads against the wall. And it's like Twitter is this, or Facebook is this place to relieve that tension. But at the same time, they're going online... And you'll see these performative pieces like we'd only been dating for 11 days and I blurted out, will you marry me? This oversharing is there because... Oh, I hate stuff like that. I hate stuff like that, not just because I've been unable to sustain any relationship for longer than four months. Uh, Actually, that actually might be the only reason. But uh, I hate that when you see someone who's like, uh, uh, we met when we reached for the same record at the fucking... Charity record yeah. store for pe- for for, pe- for amputees, and after only eleven days, he moved in with me, and we finished each other's sentences. And I'm like, I can't wait till one of you gets caught in a horny DM scandal. Fuck you. But uh, that's the other side of it. That's the other side of it, though, isn't it? Because if the constant narrative of I only seem to date shitty people or I'm in control of my love life by talking about how awful it is by controlling this narrative, then the other side of the constant humiliation and degradation and feelings of worthlessness around dating are to, yeah, are are to uh, claim that you've figured it out in some way. I think... Which no one has. I mean, most of these things end in divorce, don't they? Like, yeah. uh, it's okay. 
It's okay that I was divorced, man. And it's okay you were divorced from Elizabeth Holmes as well. I was, I was, well, we were never formally married. It was, it, it, was, it was more like, uh, co- it, it was poly. Common law divorce. <laughs> it was a uh, divorce by fighting. Um, but it's, it's, it's weird though. Like so, something that occurs to me about this as well is you're right. It's this structure people are building up. If you, as a woman build up this thing where it's like your fans, it's, it's sex in the city again. It's why a lot of girls, despite the fact that Carrie Bradshaw is like a shitty person throughout the whole show and locks into everything she gets. They idolize this woman because it's something to grapple hold of. This woman who everything goes right for her, and sure, she has shitty things happen, but it ends. She works something out when real life doesn't actually have an end other than dying. And there is no guarantee. There is actually no narrative to life. And I think that that's possibly why social media has got these people building these characters because it is this idea of control and why people love sharing these fucking shitty stories like these guys who DM them like, I want to put my dick in your ear. Like they, they hear these, th- they see these things and they're terrible. And before it would be like, well, what a j-. Like if a guy said that in real life, because it's symptomatic of the internet and anyone being able to do it, it's this thing where by sharing it, they feel perhaps less violated or maybe they just feel like they're just in whatever, however many act plays, that, whatever, however many acts there are to their life. This is like the low point in the middle, like the Empire Strikes Back of their dating life. And that any moment now is just going to swing up guy and girl. I've seen guys post just as many fucking like weird shit that women have said to them. Isn't that weird how that sort of like betrays class or or like socioeconomic origin or anything like I always make fun of the Midwestern DUI guys who are like, my life's about to turn around. Like, I just learned how to believe in myself. But really, like, upper professional class people are the same fucking way. Because because their dating life has just been this litany of humiliating failures. But they're like, yeah, that's just like, it's how you find the one. It's how you find love, yo. (laughs) Everyone believes in the sort of success equals failure formula. And I guess you kind of have to. It's like uh, it's like an opiate a bit. Like you, one of the ways you can only live in such a humiliating life in society is by just declaring that success is around the corner constantly. We always, I always make fun of MMA fighters for being the most delusional professionals on earth because they have yeah. to be. You have to believe that you're going to be the top 0.1 of 1% of fighters who actually make money and can beat everybody's asses and you're going to be a champion. But... You know, there's another truism I make fun of, and that's when fighters go, everyone's a fighter. But they are, because we all need that level of self-delusion to be alive. Yeah, and the, the, the recent thing this week about, like, why men should never hit on a woman who's wearing headphones, I'm guilty of joining in on that joke, because that article was just funny, and definitely written. Like, definitely is the, the guy has, I haven't checked, but I assume he's already said it was written as a troll, but it wasn't. He just fucked up. But they're cre- like... Again, it comes back to this idea of the Twitterverse being larger than it really is. When really, in real life, are there that many Redditor types who go up to a woman and are like actually frustrated that she has headphones on? Or is it just that there are a few hundred of these dudes who have done it? And like how many of these situations have actually happened? And really, it is this cathar- like the reaction to it by woman. It's totally fair, but it's cathartic. Like, the kind of dogpiling on this idea of, like, why men should never hit on a woman who's wearing headphones, it's the same thing as why you don't walk up to a woman in a car at a fucking traffic stop, like, knocking a window, but like, hey, you're cute. You want to, like, pull over and, like, give me your number? It's the same shit. Like, it's just... I love hijacking a plane and making the pilot fly dangerously close to another plane so I can wave to a sweetie in the window. Because I saw her at my adjacent terminal. I regularly walk no, outside and like, discharge my shotgun uh, to catch the attention of a woman walking by. Well, that thing was so cathartic because, like, I, like, rarely... I haven't really, like, barely left the house in the past, like, week because I've been so fucking yeah. busy. But, you know, every every time I do, you know, first of all, don't recommend it. It's, it's no terrible. good. Don't leave the house. Second of all, like, I just always, like, men are always just, like, being unbearable with women. Uh, And uh, 
I saw, I watched the movie. I have to watch the movie Remember Me for this article that I have to write. And, like, every scene in the movie is Robert Pattinson. He has, like, the shittiest New York accent ever. He sounds like if James Dean uh, filled a bunch of chewing gum with thumbtacks and just chewed on it for three hours. Do, is that His the one with the bleeding, really bizarre ending? Yes. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, I, well, I'm writing, an, I'm writing an article about 9-11 movies, but... Uh, he, I also, by the way, like the just first saying, scene, I hate it when a relationship you're in ends with 9-11. I hate that. That's uh, the worst. That's the worst. Again? Jesus. Uh, but keep going, sorry. Oh, Jesus, stop it, guys. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, well, like, every scene where, like, he gets late in the movie, he, like, just goes up to a woman and, like, is annoying to her. Like, he goes, when he meets, like, the main love interest in the movie, he's like, so uh, I'm doing a sociological experiment. Uh, yeah, you get a, uh, you. I want you to prove that my friend over there is wrong. Like, he, I don't even know what the fuck kind of accent he he has. It just drove me crazy the entire movie. Yeah, but that's. I just like that's like that's like a thing in movies where that's like what the hot guy does. He like goes up to the woman and he's like, "I'm having a sociological experiment," and he ends up banging her for some yeah, reason. Somehow. Uh. But, like, I see guys try to replicate that in real life, and it's just, like, fucking brutal. It's painful. And you feel bad for guys because it's humiliating to be that much of a doofus. But you feel worse than for women because there's nothing... There's, like... One of the worst things you can experience is um, someone humiliating themselves in front of you and you having to be part yeah. of it. Like, you're the only other part of it. Like, that's a fucking terrible position to be in. I think that's why the headphones thing was so cathartic because if I was a woman, I would wear headphones like everywhere. So like no guy would go up to me and be like, ah, I got a magic I, I trick. Think this is totally, <laughs> uh, I yeah. think this is totally also let's step back for a moment. I get pissed off when anyone asks me to take off my fucking headphones. You walk up to me and you're like, Hey, can you take off your headphones? Or if I'm in like a Lyft or an Uber and they're like, uh, excuse me, excuse me. I'm like angrier than I am. Even when my phone rings, which is the second most annoying thing. And, like, so the idea of someone doing that and then being like, ah, I want to show you a magic trick. And for some reason, you became Jared Leto's Joker there. And I liked it. Like, that must be the most. The, well, well, that's what the movie. Uh, Suicide Squad. How did you forget? That's like, well, that's what that movie was about. Was it like Jared Leto? Like, he learned, like, by being evil, he was like, he learned how to get laid. He was like, ah, he went up to Harley Quinn and he's like, ah, you want to see a knife trick? <laughs> but that's a. And I think that, that that what this is, and like all great scumbag topics, you can draw the line from men and women back to desperation and back to access. That this is what gives, like, people are able to get online all over the world. They're able to access so much in the world. They're able to, they're able to speak to everyone everywhere. And that's great in some ways and so, so fucking horrible in others. Because Jesus, it's just, it gives the ability for anyone to talk to anyone, theoretically. And that just means someone's going to say something terrible. So it goes from, like, those horny guys, building from one of our original things. Those horny guys who are like, hello, moi, sweetie, touch boo-boos. There, there must be, and I'm, I'm not purporting to know what these guys are like. Like, I'm just guessing this is what must be part of it. Is there, like, the beginning? of this, this hierarchy of, all right, right there is just a guy who's like, man, I'd really like to have sex with that girl. I like her bobos. I'm going to tell her. And there's something pure about that, purer than whatever other thing there is there. But there's this desperation. If you go and look up dating tips on Google News or something, there'll be like 18 articles, like dating tips for this and that. And that's the problem. It's the, the game FAQ syndrome for men. Where they're like, they've gone online, they're like, I can't get woman. And they've not done the introspection of it, maybe they don't look attractive. Maybe the, maybe the guy just is not, like, attractive to the girl he wants. But that'd be a horrible thing to face, because it would require effort. But it's like, they are looking for it. And that's where things, like, starting with, like, the game began. But now, while you've got these crazy, like, MRA types who are like, maybe this is how I fix it. Maybe this problem is not me, it's woman. And conversely, you've got women who are 
But say, just in normal dating with guys, they meet at bars, just being fucking rude or just being shitty on the path to trying to get laid. They see this story about guys don't tell me to take off your headphones. Take, like, that's horrible. They see that and it maybe th- it reflects a far more interesting version of what is probably just a series of really just fucking annoying yet boring situations. If you think of all the dates you've been on, like, really? They're probably just shit. They're not terrible. They're not newsworthy. And they're not particularly interesting to tweet about. If you told your friends about them, they'd just be like, okay. And that's the thing. I feel like that is what gets these people. That is what that is what creates a lot of these situations. Be it the performative man or woman talking about their dating life so much. Be it the sweeties of our world. It's just desperation. And they read these dating tip articles for guys, or they read them for girls. And they sit there and they say, shit, I'll try this this time. Instead of like thinking of just what may be just the basic human thing of the truth of dating is that it's just repetitive and painful and may work out, but probably won't. Which doesn't mean you shouldn't try, but it's kind of the cost of doing so. In the same way that going to the gym... Yeah, the cost of doing business is constant psychic yeah, pain. It really is. And it's not as bad as that sounds, but it's true. And it's boring. That's the worst thing. It's a part of life. It's boring, though. And it's like, so if you... Have, yeah, it's so oh boring. Holy my shit. Worst, I like deleted Twitter because all... Or yeah, Tinder because all the conversations I got in were so well, boring. What? I don't want to explain my job to people. Holy shit. Well, every time I'd go on Tinder, I'd try my best to get it away from Tinder and onto text so that it would be like some form of conversation and so that I could get to an actual date where we were face to face and talking so that I could just and sure, these dating sites have a great deal. Thousands of horrible fucking guys. But like, I bet there's a hell of a lot who are just fucking boring same way as just most people are boring and i think that all of this everything from hello sweetie shop me show penis now all the way up to an account that is talking about all of the hot girl like there's this one brilliant one i need to find it where it's like this guy talking about going to beaches and like banging models they're all the same thing of your real life just can't be this interesting it just isn't it ju- it's just, this is how... No, it's not. It never is. And by dramatizing it, and everyone dramatizes every story just by being human. And it's worse when you have to, like, dramatize the environment that people see you through. And I don't think it's as conscious as people think. I really don't. No, yeah, I think that, like, part of human memory is to drum, is to, like, just smooth out the dull and weird parts that escape a social narrative. And you, the story you end up telling is the version of events that you wish happened on some levels. On some level, we don't tell any stories that we don't want to tell. Yeah. And it's like you and I, I would say, are pretty honest on Twitter. But by accident, we're performative. It's true. We definitely, we definitely are. Oh, uh, you know, like my my honesty is is performative. Like, I mean, there's a, probably a part of there where I'm thinking about it on some level. Like, uh, wow, this is like I don't see anyone else like talking about this. So, like, yeah, I'm gonna do it. Like, that's that's performance too. No one's free from performance, and having any aspect of performance in your presence or in your being isn't necessarily a bad thing. But uh, it's good to recognize it. I think. Yeah, it's good to recognize. As many things as possible about ourselves. And dating online, and I realize not dated in a while. And in case my fiance is listening, literally since the first day, I love you. But seriously, it's this thing where online dating in general is just chaotic for guys. And I think that this is where a lot of, and this is not, this is absolutely not saying their actions are okay. I think the frustration is that if you go on OKCupid, okay and like try and message woman, you're going to message ones you find attractive. Like that's just the thing because you find them attractive because you want to do the sex thing with them. And sadly, the girls you find attractive, I'm guessing probably lots of guys find attractive. So if you don't stand out, there are less mentally composed people who might take that as an insult that doesn't exist. And sadly, I'd say most people 
are more likely to have that reaction, perhaps not to say anything, but to take offense from it. Versus the more human reaction of just being fucking disappointed. Like, oh, this girl's profile was good and I didn't get a response. That's frustrating. Versus like, fuck a woman, yeah. But that's definitely where a lot of this MRA shit grew from. It's definitely where the game came from, where you can't... The, the horrible thing you have to realize is just that girl you really like, that you really fell for, just doesn't like you as much, or just doesn't like you at all. No, it's that there's a feminist conspiracy, or... Maybe it's that I'm not doing it right and I need to create this step of like 10 things involving like a door and like a noose. Like it's it's this weird like gamification for guys to the point of horror show fuckers who are like, fuck woman, is just still in the kitchen. And for girls, it's just, I can only imagine it's just terrifying. It's just like, like dating sucks for both parties, but for women, you've got the added beauty of guys just being fucking gross and then the things that guys get as well which is just most states just being boring as fuck yeah yeah no i mean like it just you know it's internalized rage and hatred and embarrassment welcome back to the scumbag if you're enjoying our conversation about relationships well i it's your fucking problem because we had a technological issue. Felix actually severed his penis mid conversation. Very tragic. Uh, he put it back on. Just used some tape, so he's fine. Good, good to. Yeah, I uh, I severed my dick with the iron bar at the gym, uh, but the doctor said I could only do one podcast a week because I get too horny and it would break my dick off. So I'm back. Like two week healing process, all done. We're all good. Yeah, and we actually have a special guest today, the co-founder and president of Genius.com, Ilan Zekary, who I've been looking forward to saying the name incorrectly of for quite some time, and also is the only startup that has ever redeemed itself to me. So, hey. yeah, a, a, a site I have never made fun of more and then used more. I mean, Jesus Christ. Yeah, we had, a, we had kind of a fuckboy era. Well, it wasn't just that. It was just that I saw you as like, oh, cool. So it's a place for people to discuss Radiohead lyrics in an even more insufferable manner. And then this idea that stars would actually get on it and annotate them. And then people actually did. And I got mad and I just stopped talking about it. But now now you actually let people annotate the news, which is really what we want to talk about. This idea of which is great and also allows some of the worst people, I imagine, out of their shell to comment not just on the article at the bottom but during the article yeah we we uh a big part of like our our pitch to publishers because part of it is you know anyone can annotate anything but it's better when the publisher or it's ideally uh you know the publisher will incorporate the genius technology into their page so everybody who comes to the page and sees the annotation so we say like look, all these people are commenting on the bottom of your uh, article, but uh, it's not adding any engagement. It's not in the right place or whatever. But the truth is like, you know, 99% of the commenters are idiots. So a lot of what we do is uh, try to figure out what's actually good. And, you know, that's obviously totally subjective. And uh, there's a million questions you have to ask about that. But, you know, I'm here with you all because like, you know, I'm a big hater. And so, like, I like really good hating. And so I'm trying to find the, the comments that are hating, but they're actually really good. And, uh, yeah. and bring that to, to, to the floor. Well, like, yeah, the, the, the Genius platform is one of the most novel and promising new avenues to harass people in. Yeah. <laughs> I really enjoy it. I, I enjoy going on to... I don't think they've noticed yet, which is good, because I'll build up a body of material. I'm enjoying go, going over every PR website and blog... And just shitting on them. I found one earlier that I annotated that was like, how PR, like three lessons from buying a house for PR. Isn't there a law that that has to go on medium? Well, this is PR daily. And like, it's a PR daily is the worst website ever. Uh, But the great thing is, is like this article, as with all these shitty articles, is always like a total bait and switch because you get in there and it's actually nothing about either moving or buying a home. So it's just, it's perfect for the genius platform because you can watch slowly as my sanity crumbles with each comment as I realize they've been had. 
And you can't just talking to yeah. And you see, I was just talking to somebody who said, "Who sorry, sorry to interrupt oh, you." Fine. That's my, my my worst nightmare is interrupting you. <laughs> I was just talking to somebody who we were talking about a mutual friend who's in PR and how great she is and and blah blah blah. And she was like, "It's funny because you know PR is just the." shittiest most vapid terrible thing and i was like do you know ed zitron and she was like no i don't like i was like oh you got to follow him on twitter i was like he's one of the other like three pr people who has like a a fucking humanity and sense of humor yeah somewhat somewhat left to burn it out felix felix helps me Burn out, but actually, you see the kind of degradation of sanity within felix and virgil's genius annotations as well that as as you see them slowly but surely go, it devolve, just devolve into insanity as the piece goes on. Yeah. Like the Dennis Ross article on Saudi <laughs> Arabia. At the beginning, they were like, here we are to like annotate like Dennis Ross. And at the end, it's like related links for Reed Zakaria. And like they're <laughs> annotating that. Yeah, like like we, we've annotated a lot of disgusting things. Like we've annotated, uh, you know, like Rod Dreher, who thinks that trans people are like a type of demon from hell <laughs> and uh, just like all types of insane people. But the Dennis Ross thing, like when I finally have my nervous break, probably next month, people are going to say it's because it's the Dennis Ross article. That was like the worst fucking thing we've annotated. It was just it was the most sociopathic, like at least with Rod Dreher and, or any of the NRO guys. You're kind of like, well, this guy just like has stupid ideas because he's insane. But this was like a guy very consciously being evil and cynical in a way that just like makes you want to throw up. It reminded me of your just newsroom pieces. It really did. It, it, I was waiting for him to talk about how they'd like flown him out to like the Four Seasons in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, that's I mean, that was what it was like. Like he went to a conference and he's like, yeah. I went to the College of Entrepreneurship, which sounds like something that they would have had at ITT Tech. That's not a real thing. Yeah. You can't have an entrepreneurship college. I don't fucking believe it in that. It sounds like an H-1B like, scam. It is. And he was like, well, I met women there, so like it's good for women in Saudi Arabia. Everything works out. <laughs> yeah, that's it. We've, we've so, it's, like, it's like when you solve racism on Chapo. It's like, uh, we got it, fellas. One paragraph. Well, we did do that this week. We yeah, did I mean, solve racism. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's true. You did actually solve it. But I love it. It says, like, where half the group we met were a woman. Cool. Okay. Um, thanks. Thanks, Dennis. That's useful. But it is. It's amazing, though. And it, it's it's this new version of commentary. And this isn't, like, some, some bizarre PR interview. I realize I'm in PR. Fuck. But it's interesting watching Genius having gone from a thing where, like, people made fun of it to what is actually getting quite interesting is watching commentary on commentary in a more interesting way than, like, Callum Borchers of the Washington Post, who I was mentioning it to you both earlier. He did this piece, and I even think that blog or piece or anything other than, like, ejaculation or detritus is... It is basically... He took that very short Cosmopolitan article with Ivanka Trump, or which his daughter, I don't know. And he the, the interview was like three paragraphs long because halfway through, she's like, uh, yeah, I'm leaving. And he managed to make it like 2,000 words of like him quoting the entire article. It's like he like saw genius and was like, I like that. I should make that my career. Well, I think, I think that's why it's good. It's like a lot of times... An article doesn't necessitate a full other article. It's like you can, you almost wish that you didn't have to create something new. I mean, I think about like the the moment that I first saw we were hitting our stride with the annotations is when Zizek mentioned our annotations. Mm. And uh, it's like it necessitated like a whole new article from him, which I don't know. I think there's a lot of chaff in the in the uh, online publishing world. I feel like maybe three years from now, like places aren't. You know, I've talked about it before. I think all media is sort of a, like the monetary model of most media is complete fucking scam. But, yeah. you know, once that falls apart and once I'm homeless and then I come back, once the industry recovers a little bit, they're going to realize they didn't need to like commission as many posts as they did. And uh no, I think like half of articles should be annotations. 
Because yeah. they're mostly just, like, backlash to other articles. Yeah, so. it's just ridiculous, like... I remember writing school papers and just thinking, like, there's so many words here that are so dumb, but, like, it's even worse online where it's, like, in a recent article in the Washington Post, such and such author wrote, it's, like, what? Like, those words are completely unnecessary. Just go to the fucking article and say the thing. And and then Betty Johnson took it one step too far and just thought, fuck it, this is great, why bother? Just, just put it all up there. I'll put my name on it too, fuck it. I found it. That would that sounded funnier in my head. Well, no, I I think Benny Johnson is the only person who did it properly <laughs> in that he, uh, you know, like no one wants to read like you know my opinion or the other like just pretend like it's your article. Like I think it's funny. <laughs> I think that that's like the future of online publishing after Genius is just plagiarism. It yeah, not even subtle plagiarism, just straight. Like, like complete plagiarism. Like when we go to investors, we just say it's a bridge to plagiarism and they get it. Everyone's really excited about the future of plagiarism. Like I can't Especially wait. Especially in our investors. Yeah. I can't wait. Like we have an exciting project. Uh, just, I mean, you guys know that we have the live, the genius live show for Chapo, but we have an even more exciting project. We are remaking the matrix <laughs> shot for shot, word for word. In conjunction with Genius, the entire movie, <laughs> both different people. Because that's the future. You're just going to do things that have been done before and pretend like they're new. I, 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 and I have one question as well. Do you ever speak to Benedict Devins? <laughs> I've crossed paths with, uh, with the, the young man in the, uh, in the halls of Andreessen and Horowitz. I don't think we've ever said hi, but... Uh, I, I, I see the kind of shit he writes. How much would I have to donate to charity for you to, like, slap the books out of his hands or stop him in a locker? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, what's to, we could talk offline about this. Yeah, I'm not going to get you get your investment money pulled yet. But it's, yeah. but it's interesting. I think that, as I think about it, it really is just... Genius will be copied at some point, if not by a completely different startup, but by a publishing house themselves, like fucking, I don't know, Harvard Business Review, or someone will be like, oh, we've got this new innovative platform where commentary can happen throughout the article, kind of like Kindle highlights, and they'll they'll cite everyone except Genius, and it will just literally be Genius. I can see I that mean, happening. If you'll allow me to get on my Genius soapbox for a moment, like, the, the, the thing about Genius is it's not... It's not just the ability to put a little bloopy next to some text. Like, that's actually, you know, it's not simple to make that look good and, and feel right and use, but, like, it's not that hard. The tricky thing is uh, is collaborative annotation, annotation that works across a million different websites and platforms, and also a kind of ethos of, like, what the hell are we doing here? And so I think that, um, you know, definitely there have been some sites, like, you know, Medium tried to have, writers annotate their own articles and like people are just like this is useless and like that's because nobody was there who cared whether the annotation was interesting or not and genius is sitting there kind of trying to figure out how to how to how to signal whether something is interesting or not and uh you know other other publications have tried you know basically like bloopies remember like i think grantland had some sort of footnoting thing or whatever that was all right but you know genius is just kind of weirdly obsessed with like Good annotations. And it's not easy. Like, there are a lot of shit annotations on News Genius, too. But, like, we're trying to uh, figure out how to how to make the good ones happen. And, you know, what Felix and uh, and Virgil have been doing, and now, um, uh, what's his face? Alex? Who mm-hmm. the Hamilton? Alex, yeah. Alex Al- Nichols. Alex Low been, like, good ones. And, and now Hamilton. a lot of the, uh, the sort of, uh, you know, funny, funny dirtbags uh, who follow these guys and, like, look up to them are also leaving really good critical annotations on, on media. And it's like, we hired Leah Finnegan. Uh, she's a genius. Like, she's, she's hilarious, and she's a really good critic. And so she went in and sort of set the stage and set the tone for, like, what being mean but also smart and funny uh, was like in annotations. And, you know, you got to lead by example. We did it in music, too, and, like, with rap, it was very delicate and complicated because there are a bunch of idiots who want to leave bad annotations. So you have to create a culture where, like, no, it's got to be good, you know. So that's that's the challenge, and it's not just technology. I wouldn't know. I only listen to ra- uh, everything except rap and country, but mm-hmm. I, I only listen to Hamilton, which is sort of a combination <laughs> of rap and country. But I think uh, I think that like the 
what like geniuses do. It's like sort of an underrated problem that people have had is just sort of building a community of users that isn't completely shit. Like I, I love Gog. I love. I loved Gawker. I love Deadspin, but it has the shittiest comments ever. I've never like read any any comments on any articles I've written, and that's like most community. Like YouTube, YouTube is like YouTube comments. It's like the Somalia of the internet. There's no law governing the land, and Twitter, Twitter, terrible. Like most of these places, trash. But like, if you like building an actually sort of stratified community of users. No one ever tries to do that. Yeah, and I, I, I feel... That sort of died, that sort of, like, died with web forums, now that you think, of, like, now that I think about it. Like, when no one was making money off the internet at all, except for Mr. Skin, <laughs> that was when you had, like, the most stratified communities of users. And, like, the you knew which places had, like, <laughs> funny, good groups of users and which places were shit, and now it's just... Now that they've added money to the mix, it somehow made it like most things terrible. I don't know why that is. Well, uh, at all. Look at except for Mike. Except for Mike. Yeah, Mike. Is Mike's good. the best. Yeah. A Mike dot com. We're referring to. <laughs> policy yes. Mike. Yeah. Yeah, it's, but, yeah. I still call it policy Mike. It still lives in my heart. As oh, right. Sorry. Mike. Yeah. Well, but no, like that's the thing though. Is like on some uh, maybe it's like the upvote system on Genius. Like I was anticipating. That, like, uh, I was going to get a bunch of, like, shitty replies. Not shitty, like, they're calling me a piece of shit, but, like, not funny and boring. But I don't know. I think there's, like, a barrier to entry where you actually have to read the article. People don't usually do that on Twitter. Yeah. It's just a little tricky to yeah. use. To, yeah. Like, it, you know, it's that going to a website and a- appending a URL to the... To, for, for people out there in scumbag land who don't know how to do it, you have to go any article and then you then you type genius.com slash before the url to the left of the url which is like something that doesn't really exist anywhere it's hard to do on your phone so you know there's there are a few barriers to entry that you got to put in some effort to to annotate you could download the chrome extension too is another way but like these are niche things to do and so you know your average like spam shit poster is less likely to uh, do all that stuff. Yeah, and if you're also one of our other scumbag users, you need something called a web browser to access <laughs> websites as well. Um, yeah, we've do, we, we've done market research. All of the people who listen to us listen to us from the jitterbug device, the phone for old people. Well, is it yes or no? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's just we don't know why the show comes with the jitterbug. It just does. Those are all of our listeners are in hospice. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't have browsers. No, they all. The only way it could possibly work is they all use Kindles, which can support podcasts, but nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, when you get a Kindle, they're like books or podcasts, and we got all the people who said podcasts. <laughs> they're like, I will buy a podcast. I love it. that this idea though that like the only people that listen to us are on Kindles, so like really old people. So there's like some like eighty six year old. Ah, come. Like, just like in an old folks home just sitting around being like wow sweetie this is all of our listeners all of our listeners are in hospice care nursing homes <laughs> or they're in one of those situations where like you live with the grandparents I don't know what that's about some people do it I'm not here to judge them because they are our listeners but then you get the family multiple when they do live with the grandparents so that's good for us even though our advertiser Theranos has left us, yeah, thanks Theranos, a real, real, fuck, yeah, thank you, real fucking terrible situation there. But I mean, you mentioned Medium, and Medium, I have to say, you know what? I like writing on it. I think it's one of the best, like, just for writing words on a page. But it has to have the, a more insufferable community, not necessarily the worst, more insufferable community, because, and I have this wider theory that a lot of these startup promotion sorry the valley promoted websites of which genius is one but not as bad as medium twitter being another one they cater so clearly and transparently i'm gonna sound like a fucking steve crowder or something here but it's like to this kind of like very liberal tech focused audience like Patton oswald was i was ranting about this last night but Patton oswald while fucking pipe bombs were in elizabeth new jersey like exploding and it's like a big gurning face of fucking Patton Oswald is there because they know like most fucking people who are going to talk about it are like, dude, Patton Oswald, dude. 
and Medium is fucking the same. Like, I don't follow that many tech people, but every fucking arc is like, Chris Messina, the guy who invented the hashtag, it's like being the inventor of fucking gout. I got some shit from the hairpay in a website I've never met. Ali Asher to the... to Okay, you know what? They got one. It only took 18 hours to the four white, white male policemen who beat me for checking the health of a sick black man in their custody. Finally, you found an article of importance. And then straight on to a Ringer article, which reality stars inspire the most internet content? That's Medium. And all of these articles get shit to... Medium, Medium is also half open letter. Yeah, it's, it's like an open letter to my mother. My mother died yesterday. So, like, I love those ones as well, because, like, the person in question could never read it. Yeah, no, I mean, it's like, I mean, like, real courageous, like, open letter to Adolf Hitler. <laughs> wow, why didn't you say it when he was around? Only cowards talk about people when they're not around to defend themselves. That's what I think. But it's like, if you were right, though, Felix, like, internet communities are fucking dead. Twitter is like, Twitter pretends like it has communities, but all it's done is, weird as this sounds, it's like they've created a new version of high school cliques. I mean, I mean that's, every, like... That's everything, though. Like, every internet community, I think, is destined to become that. It just, like, it, de- it depends, like, on how shitty or good, like... Because of the structure of Twitter inherently being a stream, even with hashtags, it is built for the most popular person to be in it. A web forum, theoretically, back in those days, someone of newness who posted enough could... And there was a permanence to it. With Twitter, it's just like, who's the biggest jack-off in the world at the moment? And we're both fucking guilty of it. And it's, but yeah, yeah. I mean, that that was sort of like web forums too, though, right? I mean, like most. Okay, who who do you think like the most popular guy on like Game Facts was? Well, Game Facts. He probably sucked. He probably sucked. Well, Game Facts is actually an interesting one. If we get into our internet history, if putting on a fedora here, I don't even consider. Th- if anything, I think Game Facts is about as confusing and random as Twitter is because. Even when you got to like, unless it was like a really fucking niche game, it's like thousands upon thousands of people being like, how do I get past the start menu? And then like 900 people being like, retard, you press select. And then like 900 other people being like, start, it's start, you idiot. And it's like this horrible thing. But I remember the old web forums of like, I don't know, like a random fucking EverQuest server. There was a certain community there. Yeah, I'm cool. But I don't see that on Twitter. It's like you have to earn your way into a possible click of things. It's curious to watch that community is dead. I think I think the opposite though. Yeah. I think that there there is there is like a more enforced hierarchy, like on the old internet. Right. For for whatever fucking reason there just was. Now there are less barriers to entry because there are more people. Yeah. Which, I don't know, usually in economics is the opposite. Or it's the same. I don't really remember. It's been like three years since I took economics. But, <laughs> uh... What was, like... So, like, what was your... What sort of gave you the idea to, like, make Rap Genius the community? To, like, to sort of, like... It, like, what... How did you, like... How Everyone has this weird story of how they came to... I guess monetize their existence on the internet. I mean, Ed Ed started off as a games journalist. I started out just talking shit on MMA websites. Yeah, and he was an he was a philosopher. <laughs> uh, what like what brought you there? Like what? Yeah, so it was that's a that's a good question. I feel you on that. Everyone trying to sort of monetize just how they're rolling on the internet. Like we, you know, it was kind of in college. Uh, I'll age myself. I graduated in two thousand six. So post Kerry Bush election, best years of the uh, internet. A lot of a lot of uh, uh, my friends. We all got blogs on Blogger, which is another Ev Williams joint. So like back to Medium. Like Medium's terrible, but I got to give it up that dude made Blogger, Twitter, and Medium. So yeah. like, he's good at products. So yeah. like, you need someone to make a product. Medium is like a good product. Yeah. Like it's. I will a, give it up. So it's just so he's like the terrible, creator of the atomic bomb. <laughs> right, yeah, right. yeah, he's he's Oppenheimer, <laughs> um, and uh, and so we were all blogging, and we kind of had like a blog community, and it took us out of the doldrums of depression of, of like and like nihilism of like the Bush era. So we kind of used comedy uh, and and expression and commenting on each other's blog spots to like laugh and and keep ourselves busy when you know 
we were feeling pretty bad about stuff. And so, yeah, it's blog therapy. Everyone's been through it. I feel like, you know, I feel like that's kind of the spirit out of which a lot of like internet creativity happens is you're just depressed and you take a leap of faith and start a podcast or whatever. And, um, and so we were doing that and then the blogs died down, like blogger died, everyone graduated and like tried to figure out what life was. And I think that, you know, we were just screwing around and like learning a little bit about programming, um, especially my roommate uh, at the time, Tom, who's uh, my co-founder of Genius. And so, uh, you know, Tom was this guy who was super literal minded, always wanted the answer to things. Very funny, but also like, just like, no, what does it mean? What is the deal? And so we'd be watching like Deadwood and he'd be like pausing it and being like, what do you say? And we'd all be like, no one knows. Like, it doesn't matter. He'd be like, no, it matters. And, <laughs> and so he was also getting into rap at the time. And uh, myself and some of our other friends have all listened to rap for, you know, at that point, 15, 20 years or whatever. And so he was just asking questions and, you know, we were just talking about Cameron and, uh, and we were like, let's build a website. And, uh, and, you know, we were also kind of in this like mindset of, I hate my job and I want to not have a job. What were you doing at the time? I worked at Google, uh, and, uh, Tom worked at a, some finance company doing technology and like computer repair. He'd like go up to someone and like restart their computer and say, there, and uh, he was also, you know, doing fixing things. printers for girls. Yeah. You know, like where we've all been. And uh, and so we just made it and people seemed to like it. And it was also it was kind of like the blog revival, like four years after it all died or something. And uh, and so it was just our friends and a lot of the same friends who had blogs kind of like making jokes, but doing something a little bit more like collective and constructive and not like so free form. And uh, and it was just us kind of doing a project together and then strangers followed along. So similar to like, you know, you get followers on Twitter who then become your homies who you like at reply or whatever. And it was very similar to that. It just kind of grew brick by brick. And then we decided, you know, okay, there's a hundred people now who are contributing annotations to music and poetry and stuff. And, you know, this is obviously a bunch of people we don't know and it's getting a little unwieldy. So like Wikipedia at that point was like a pretty big phenomenon and we were pretty impressed by how Wikipedia worked and uh, and we thought like maybe this could be really cool if we let anyone uh, annotate and of course the quality will go to shit because we've been you know sort of reading everything that comes through and whatever and so we were worried that it was just going to become terrible but we just tried to build a whole system of points and votes and moderation and communication infrastructure to see if we could do a thing where we open it up and it, it's good and we open it up and it was bad and we changed it and, and modified it. And we've been still doing that for years and we still go on, you know, new songs and think, Oh shit, we need to change this, this moderation work so that, you know, this idiot can't do what they're doing. And, you know, it's pretty elaborate. It's kind of like, there's, you know, there's all these layers of, of editorial privilege and, uh, and stuff you can do on the site. And so, you know, we just kind of got into the whole like crowdsourcing community building technology thing and, it's a cool website. Like, do you want to know the answer to any of the the new uh, the new music? Like, you can you can find a pretty well written interpretation of, of what's going on. Before Genius, if you wanted to know what Everlast Everlast meant when he said, "Do you know how it feels to walk <laughs> in that man's shoes?" You would have to go to lyricsmeaning.com and they had like every fucking pop up, like it just like all the bad pop ups, like horny singles in your area. Ride from Ukraine, blah blah yeah, blah. Yeah, what was it with those fucking sites? Like they always they were <laughs> shit. They were shit, and anyone there was no like there was no layer of editorial privileging. So like, you know, if you were like a flat Earth truther, you had the same you had the same importance as like a guy who happened to be Everlast cousin, right? So like, there was no like separation. So if you were you were like, this song is about how the Earth is flat. You had to the outside viewer, you had the same like level of importance as Everlast Cousin, who knew what the song was about because Everlast told him. Now, if you're like Everlast's like stepbrother or whatever, you get a green check mark. That's actually yeah. mine and Virgil's editor at Genius is Everlast well, Cousin. My, <laughs> my favorite thing is I found this before the show uh, the Genius annotation for which completely disproves everything we've said for I Like to Move It by Real to Real. Uh-huh. And it is, I like to move it, move it, I like to move it, move it, I like to move it, move it, you like to move it. And there's one unreviewed annotation. It says, he likes it when rurals move their booty. 
<laughs> what was that, girl? It's G. This is, this is actually the article that I did this week. Girls. Yeah, that's unreviewed annotation. Yeah, we've, we've struggled with the unreviewed annotations for a long time. The guy who annotated that is stupid. That song is about the rise of fascism. <laughs> it's about like how Italian futurism begat fascism. That's what it's about. I, I, I think it's beautiful as well because I really, I really was hoping I'd get onto this and find some like sad sack of shit who's like, okay, this has got to mean something. Because that was what I always found from lyric... Lyric meanings, you'd get like, at Queens of Stone, my favorite band, and I'd read it and be like, oh, fuck. Oh, God, this person's like actually having like a mental breakdown. Because like, as the song goes on, their annotations go on. It's just like, what? What are you talking about? Where'd you get? I hate it. I hate it when my wife leaves me in the middle of an annotation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it affects how I do it. I, I loved it as well, because like there was somewhere it's just like, well, you see three paragraphs. And it's like one line. And it's like, I, 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 that, and I mean, overinterpretation of information and masturbating in a textual fashion is essentially the internet. So it's a natural progression. Well, well, Ellen talked about like the, the middle stage between like the end, uh, like 2004 to about 2007. That was when all the blogs that were like, you know, living under President Trump. Like when they're all those, I read all of them. I read all of them, by the way, because I was 14 when Bush got reelected. And I was like, how the fuck could this happen? I saw Fahrenheit 9-11. This is, this is bullshit. Tell me, Atrios, how did this yeah, happen? Yeah. Me, my friend, my Fire friend. Fire Dog Lake. Me and my friend took a train ride uh, that day and we didn't say a word and we split headphones and we listened to green day boulevard of broken dreams oh god i was <laughs> on that it was the most depressing day in I america i put on my black hoodie and listened to mosh i drank a fuck ton of <laughs> yeah, whiskey yeah the m&m song about bush <laughs> the m&m pro carry song. yeah that was the height isn't that that's the best m&m being like yo john carry's a war hero <laughs> you gotta believe in yourself but uh no like no i literally i think period. i did the same thing though i'm actually scared now i was i believe Oh, what year was this? 2005? No, not... 2004. Four, four, yes, 2004. Four. Yeah, it was, so it was my first year of college. I was doing. I was literally just in my room. I was, like, down to 130 pounds because I was, like, really depressed. Just drinking, like, whiskey, like, Glen Morangi, and just listening to that shitty album on repeat, that fucking Green Day album. Oh, God, we're all, u- <laughs> we're all united in that shit. Yeah, but the middle period in between that, because that died down a bit. Yeah. I think it died down after Katrina. A little, like, if I remember right. Katrina was sort of like the climax, and then, like, it thinned out the herd of blogs because, like, some blog, like, Talking Points Memo and shit would have, like, scoops, and then, like, the other blogs would just sort of be polemic, and there wasn't really inter- any interconnecting thread yeah. at this time. Like, you know, this is this goes to another point, but it's sort of why like right wing presidents are never good for the left. The left just gets weirdly dispersed in times of right wing presidents. It's never accelerationism doesn't work. It only works in the movie V for Vendetta. And that's literally the only reason people think it works. But anyway, uh, the connecting thread between that time and like now was the communities that people built around like TV show fandom shit like fucking that's what Tumblr is. Tumblr is like all these people who are like, uh, I'm like, uh, I relate to fucking Kai from Vampire Diaries. I don't know if that's a character in the show, but yeah. like probably, you know, that's like one of those millennial names. But uh, yeah, troll. That was troll up. <laughs> I assume that. Which is that? I think that's like a weird thing about the internet, though, because for many years. It was harder to eat. It was hard to build like this broad coalition of people who are unified politically, even under Bush. Uh, but the easiest thing people could do was build communities around their entertainment consumption. Yeah. It's like, it's like a more natural thing. And maybe, I don't know, maybe it's because if you like the same shit artistically, you, you find people who, I don't know, you, you, you kind of fucking you get into a rhythm with when you talk to them, I guess. I don't know. This is like, this is another one of those things where I reveal that I have no idea what people are like the more that I talk about it. With, but we're talking to someone who runs a startup. Sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, um, but it, it, it's, um, 
It, it's... I don't know. I don't think anyone can assume to know what people like, though. Because there was just this big fucking flame out in England to do with... I don't know why people keep trying to create communities around the actual listening of music. I don't think that's how people do things. Other than, like, concerts. And... Like turntable FM. No, yeah. Well, there's, <laughs> or, uh... there was a worse one, Crowd Mix. It never actually launched, yeah. and they burned like two million pounds a month, and like on the stupidest shit. They were incredible, actually. Like I kind of respect them for how shit they were. And it was like, like it's this. It was like social playlists, and you share and talk about the music. And no, no one does that. People talk about the things they read. I don't think people listen at the same time and talk about it as they're listening because they're listening to the fucking music. Not at the same time, but I think there's like there's like an under. You know, like, sort of the middle period of the internet was people, like, watching, like, fucking Doctor Who. And now it's people listening to music. Like, that's the next big, the next big community that people have formed. Yeah. And, and music is where people... They're trying, it's like, they're trying to do this, like, you know, OVO radio, like, Frank Ocean, woodworking live, you know, on Apple Music, and... And people talk about it on Twitter at the same time, but it all feels pretty limp, honestly. Like uh, there's nothing like super energetic about the whole thing. What? Yeah. And and Frank, what I love about like Frank Ocean and social media, Frank Ocean's an unfair example to choose, but I love how Twitter has managed to let me know multiple times a day that people I know like Drake. Because I didn't know that everyone fucking liked Drake, and now everyone likes fucking Drake. Funnily enough, only white people I can't really work that. But it's always exclusively fucking like random white people on the field. Be like, ah, Drake, screenshot of Drake. And you just that could just that could just like be the people you follow, though. Yeah, yeah, I think that could. I mean, that is I, oh, this I'm, is like this is this is, this is the weird thing. This is the weird thing about where this current level of the internet is at. Yeah, because I always I always think about this when people have these comparisons that are like, uh. Everyone on Facebook's stupid. Everyone on Twitter is smart. <laughs> it's like, no, no, no. That just means that, like, everyone that you actually know in your life, the people on your Facebook, it just means that you, like, only... The only people that will tolerate you are stupid. Yeah. Like, that's all that means. Twitter, you just get to pick... Like, you're not actually friends with people. You just get to pick, and maybe through some course of events, you get to know them, but it's not really the same thing. It becomes a... Uh, you know, like, you know, fuck me, fuck me for saying this because like half of my probably like half of my fucking job is making fun of shit that I see on any on Twitter or whatever. But it is a self-fulfilling prophecy. You do. You end up. Everything that you end up hating about social network X is everything that you've elected to see now that we can, you know, hyper target every single person we want to look at all the time. Yeah. And it's and it, it, you know what? You you're completely right. It might just be the fucking people I like, but it is, uh, and it, it is true that you can also see this shining through in when you talk about Twitter and like the people you choose to follow. You can see Twitter moments is it fascinates me because it's really shown exactly like who they are catering to. That's why it's always like it's not like they cover and they they do this. I I it's my own personal opinion. I don't believe for a fucking second that Twitter is, like, catering to any audience other than a great deal of white liberal people. Because, sure, you'll get, like, rapper mention, rapper mention, Ellen, Ellen, Pat Oswald, Ellen, Ellen. It's like, they won't, they, like, they won't choose a side in politics until they do. And it's just weird. It, tar it targets media people. Yeah, like, exactly. That's, that's the whole that's thing. That's the best summary. See, this is why you're the smart one. Like, fucking hell. The one thing, the one thing about Twitter, though is at least, I think, unique amongst all social networks, there's a big chunk of people who are just trying to be funny. And, like, a lot of people fail at it, but, like, a lot of people are successful at it. And, you know, I find Twitter to be just at least there are people trying to make jokes, which is more than you can say for, I think, any other social network. And that did, that seemed to, like, disappear from the internet for a while. Yeah. Like, it all seemed to be very serious for a while because... There was like a very Keith Olbermann period of the internet oh. where you mean there is a good the, period, the, the good period, yeah. but no, like uh, there was a period when everyone on their blog would be like, they would write a, how dare you, Mr. Bush post oh, yes. and 
then it turned into like you know i cried when i saw obama in the summer of 2008 and then you know just like a but i don't i don't really know why this was maybe it was economic hardship makes people really earnest assholes who lie about crying i don't know but uh it did sort of the the forced brevity of it did force people to be funny finally again yeah and it's not that and unfortunately it's not that fun no <laughs> it's shit it's terrible it's bullshit but it's i saw a good joke the other day it was uh oh uh you said this car has uh on star i thought you said open bar <laughs> and i was like that justifies the medium I'm- Hell yeah. Oh, uh, Christ on a fucking... That, that, I was like, she got that done in 115 characters, I, including spaces. I actually saw the best joke on Twitter the other day, and I'm being serious here. It was, of course, Wu-Tang Goku, the the roommate of... Daler! Uh, of CJ, CJ Emery's. His roommate did this amazing one in that format of, like, Bay, hey, come over. And it's just, Bay, hey, come over. And he just starts with, hey, I'm w- not wearing panties. Hey, come on, my parents aren't home. Hey. Just say- <laughs> it's, a, it's impossible to explain. Taylor is one of the strangest fucking people on Twitter. They- he's impossible to explain. But he, he started the whole green bean thing. Yeah. He's the greatest. But the, the great... I think... Uh, that on its own wouldn't uh, be funny. It was just seeing it within the stream of, like... Of course, for my work, I follow a bunch of tech people, a bunch of media Twitter people. So within, like, this pontification loop, or this like joke pontification loop, and I don't want to cannibalize our next episode too much, but where everyone's like trying to be funny or cool or interesting, but like real life, um, there's just this random thing of that in the middle, just shit, or like him saying "fuck a sucker ding dong," <laughs> like yeah, that was uh, tweet tweet of the year that or the guy who said the count from Sesame Street but put it in three parentheses. <laughs> that was good. It's probably the best tweet of the year, but. Uh, <laughs> You know what? You know what? The older I get, the more I like the open bar type people. The more I like people <laughs> with like the tortured joke formats because it's very honest. There's like a charming earnestness to it that like, I don't I don't know. It's uh it's like a goofy like if you've ever been to like a wedding of an extended family member. There's just some like goofy 60-year-old guy who you don't know who he's related to. He's just he's making shitty jokes, but they're just incredibly endearing for some reason. Uh, and I actually, I actually think that should be the future of the internet. I think they should reward the people who make the jokes where they're like, "I'm in the navy for this tweet." Uh, well, <laughs> those are the best. Well, Ellen, like you say him. you're you say you're not active on Twitter. Are you one of those people that browses that that Twitter claims makes up like ninety percent of their user base? I'm pretty. I'm pretty, like, I I consider myself an addict, so I, like, take real steps to, like, not wake up and dive down the garbage disposal and just be depressed. Not so, the same. Uh, <laughs> so, I, uh, I am not that big of a lurker, you know, but I think... I think maybe lately a little bit more as I've, like, discovered some people I thought are funny. And also the election, I think, draws me a little bit uh, into it just to feel not so terribly alone and terrified by like the creeping, like horrifying nature of everything. So I, I, I've been a little bit more on Twitter. Like I, I wish, I wish I had more followers, but like at the same time, I don't like, I'm kind of, a, I'm, I'm sort of like a one foot in one foot out. Uh, no, I don't, I don't, I, I post, I like reshare promotional genius Facebook posts. Like if you go to my Facebook feed, it's like, you know, uh, t- 21 Savage explains, uh, you know, his latest hit and I'll just reshare that stuff, uh, because, uh, I'm promoting, you know, my company and it's the good work that people are doing and stuff. But like, I really never read my Facebook feed cause there's literally zero content on there. Like I, I go check out Twitter because there's, there's tons of content, but like there's no content on Facebook and I kind of bored of Instagram. Twitter's the, Twitter is the only social network that I find actually entertaining. I think Instagram has a lot of program uh, problems. With, it is boring. It, it and again, really is. I. Uh, but uh, I, what you're saying is you're a Google Plus man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a plus man. Google I'm a plus Buzz man. man. 
Uh, <laughs> dig man, I'm a, also dig with two G's. Big but, dig toolbar yeah, user. Hell yeah, Fuck hell yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm on Fuckler. I'm on uh, <laughs> back on WordPress. I am. I have an exciting new assignment for my editors at WordPress. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I, I I go on I go on mattress underground forum a lot. It's a bed and mattress and pillow forum and sheets and stuff. There's a, a pretty important user there named Phoenix who responds to everybody's <laughs> questions with like twenty thousand word breakdowns where the the ultimate bottom line is you got to go test it for yourself. I yeah I'm that's a good one. I'm on uh, disgusted dads forum. I'm on the family court forum. Uh, I, I'm on all of those. I have been triple right. parentheses family court. I've been running <laughs> a parentheses family sting court operation judge. on the Sons of Confederate Veterans Forum for quite some time. Ooh. Ooh. I've I've been uh, secretly pretending I am American, and one day I'm going to show them, and I think that the implosion should actually kill every member. I like uh, I like Ed's Ed. I like your American accent because you just like sound like me <laughs> yeah. when you do. <laughs> Can you do it? I, it's like, I don't even know how to do an American accent. It's actually funny you ask, because every time I get asked, I freeze up, and I'm like, hey, I'm an American. It's like, ah, fuck it. In fact, it reminds me of a funny story. It, it's just a funny story. It involves me nearly getting my ass kicked. So one time, I found out I was in college. I didn't know that Arkansas was not pronounced Arkansas. So I was at college. I was like, hey, I'm from Arkansas. And this guy from Arkansas was there. He was like, what's your fucking problem, man? I'm like, Jesus, mate. All right, it's Arkansas. I know. He's they what? It's fucking Arkansas. He's screaming in my face. I'm like, uh, shit. And I had like a friend like pull me aside and earnestly explain that that's not how you say Arkansas. I don't like, why, why was he so mad? I don't. It, like, that's the least... I can't think of anything less justified to be mad about. You get mad about real shit. This like, is a Penn uh, State. Someone got to. You should get mad about. Well, he was. I don't want to make accusations. That was Joe Paterno. He was actually Joey Joe Paterno Sanders. is who got mad at Ed, and he was like, "I have to go cover up a scandal." Like he had just got done covering up a scandal. He was. He and was, was like the scene, his yeah. hands at the time. It was like the scene in Mystic River where like Sean Penn tries to like break free of the cops and shit. But uh yeah. Yeah, that was that's, that's, that's all, I didn't I life. didn't finish my Joe Paterno. I didn't write a Joe Paterno joke to finish today, I'm sorry. <laughs> I usually do it every day. It's like sort of a creative exercise I do with myself. My morning pages. Yeah. I have five hundred days of Joe Paterno. <laughs> I'm on day two ninety four. I love that movie. <laughs> oh. Josh Gordon Levitt dates Joe Paterno. <laughs> I like the idea of Zoe Deschanel being Joe Paterno in a movie. Yeah, yeah. That's what I would, if I was if I was rich, I would I would just do a movie. I would just be like, what is Joe Paterno? <laughs> Joe Paterno. And I would make it really ham I would make it really ham fisted. Like she'd be like, oh, I have to go cover up a secret. <laughs> 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 oh, you know, you do realize we're like five years from an apologist Joe Paterno movie, like in the style of ben the Benghazi. I make, movie. I'm writing it. No, I'm actually, writing it. It's it's called it's called some secrets are best left untold. <laughs> well, I actually hate to say it, but I'm going to beat you to market with my Rob Schneider one, the Paterno. It's like Joe, <laughs> Joe, did you cover this up? <laughs> that's I mean that's the way you do it. Is just like make it silly. Like that's. <laughs> When we finally like forgive ourselves for uh, like the Iraq War, we're gonna just it'll ju because like going back to two thousand six, you've put me in a like feed like a feedback loop thinking about the best times in America, the second Bush administration, internet, <laughs> and there were all these movies called like The Green Zone, where it was like a troop goes to Iraq, and he's like, "Whoa, the war is bad," and like no one saw those because no one wants to feel bad. But the only way America will ever accept, like, the crimes that we committed in Iraq and the Iraq war is a bad idea is, like, if it's a silly movie. Yeah. Is, like, if it's, like, like Ed's idea for the Joe Paterno movie. If they're like, cool, whoops. <laughs> like, yeah, like, it has to, it has to be very, like, very Benny Hill. Yeah, and, like, Rob Schneider walks in and there's just a letter that says there are no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. In Iraq. And he like slips and actually like puts white out over the no. 
Yeah, Ooh. he. Uh, it'll be like, uh, what's that movie? What's the movie where like the guy has to teach the woman how like not to be Cockney? You know what I'm talking about? My Fair, my fair lady. lady. It'll be like that, yeah, but with Ahmed Chalabi. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Imagine a My Fair Lady with Rob Schneider. Oh, uh, just imagine anything with Rob Schneider. I actually was. I actually. That's all the- I do when I close my eyes. Yeah, <laughs> other people have nightmares. You have worse. But you know, it yeah. actually just occurred to me. I do have a genius-related question because apparently we're interviewing someone. Um, so, what? Why did you make that massive change, though? Because I remember the whole all the press about annotate the web and all that. But what was it that, like, why did you make that shift? And please don't just say it was a natural progression. Like, was there a natural? Was it like a business decision? Was there a th- like a thought process beyond like this kind of makes sense? I it, actually, it's weird. It came out of a, uh, a like a sort of random conversation I had with Rob Schneider. <laughs> Ooh, and <laughs> um, he he had just had a vision for how the internet should work, and it was compelling. He was uh, astral projecting. <laughs> uh, it it was you know like it was basically. At the beginning, when we were rap exegesis, uh, before we were rap genius, before we were genius, like, it was a thing where people didn't, it wasn't a site, it wasn't like a rap, I guess even a rap forum, like if you go to like Kanye to the, or like a, another rap forum, people are talking about fashion, people are talking about shoes, people are talking about other shit. Like, what happened was we, we attracted rap fans who were just liked annotating. Right. And liked sort of knowledge video game playing or whatever. And so uh, very early on, people were like annotating poetry and other and annotating the state of the union and stuff like that. And so I think, you know, it was a bit of a natural progression is the truth because people were just copying and pasting shit off the internet and posting it on genius.com. Like, so Thomas Friedman would write like a column about like going to like, um, you know, uh, uh, going to like a fish market or a public or restroom. Right. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like, I like the ones where he like would talk to the cab driver and you do like, you've, you, I mean, you felt bad for everyone he ever talked to. <laughs> yeah. He's like, whatever nationality he was, he'd be like, so, uh, how do we fix your country? <laughs> yeah. And the cab driver would like hand him a fish. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the fish represents uh, the <laughs> IMF. Yeah. Uh, and so, so, <laughs> so yeah, what was happening is people were just copying and pasting stuff from the internet, posting it on genius.com. And like, you know, it just didn't make sense. Like it wasn't, it, we had this like black background website that like looked like a motorcycle forum and, uh, oh, yeah. and like people were annotating wall street journal columns. And so, it, we just, we were like, you know, we, I kind of, you know, to get earnest for a second, like I actually do think like I use Google reader uh, a lot when it was not only an RSS feed, but it, you could also use bookmarklet sharing. Yeah. And so you could uh, highlight a line and share with a comment and then people would comment and vote. And it was essentially like a funny way to annotate the internet with your friends and read and sort of read with your friends on the internet instead of feeling like totally lonely you had this funny, smart community of people annotating stuff, but it happened in the context of this weird RSS feed. And a lot of, uh, you know, Tom, my co-founder of Genius, and other people who work with us also were up in that. And so the sort of combination of the knowledge annotation project and the sort of silly, critical, collaborative reading that happened on Google Reader for many years, which was like something I'd, you know, be on all day. Like, you know, I think it was basically like, you know, the vision is you're reading the brow on your browser and you're totally alone. I'd rather read on my browser, read these articles and see what my friends are saying. And, or if not my friends, like we were talking about Twitter, like other people I randomly select who I don't know who are funny or I don't know yet or whatever. So it was just an idea of like, and I still think it's the idea. It's a long project, but like, I don't think the mobile browser is a good experience. And I think the mobile browser should be way more like immersive. Your friends, what they're saying and good. And so if I could read, you know, in, if I'm reading the New York times, which I still do, despite myself, uh, I want to see what, you know, Felix has to say about this editorial or whatever. And, uh, and that's kind of the idea of the, the sort of reading the internet together and laughing and not feeling so alone. Yeah. And it's, I mean, the problem, like this recurring theme, we've talked about these different eras of the internet. The problem has always been sort of overpopulation. It's like uh, the deer in Staten Island, but uh, you 
you overpopulate it with too many, like, I guess in the case of the second Bush term, too many blogs, or in that middle period, too many blogs about Doctor Who, or probably now, like, too many Twitter accounts for the premise is like, I snark the news. Uh, this this kind of, you know, at its, at its idealized form, this works because overpopulate, overpopulation is cold because it just, it's an extension to existing platforms. Mm -hmm. There is never a need, there isn't a need for this, uh, I guess, overflow feedback loop where, uh, you know, uh, I can go to an article in moments and look at uh, what the clap back to the clap back to the side eye uh, Taylor Swift said to the people that said she's asexual. I, like enough of that. I think it. I think it is interesting though, and I and I and I track my snark for one of those rare occasions because when I said oh, it's a natural progression, that's usually some wanky startup shit where it's like. Oh yeah, it's natural progression, which never is defined. But it's, so you're saying that people literally would copy paste articles and annotate them just on the original platform? I don't. I don't fucking... That was happening all the time, and That's so weird. And, uh, it was like we it was just you know with music, it was hard enough to deal with like all the copyright holders for lyrics. Like that was like two years uh, of my life that I'll never get back. And um, the idea of fighting you know, basically an unbounded set of copyright fights with publications. Like, what if it really took off and everyone was always copying and pasting stuff and putting it on Genius? Like, we just would have to deal with so much shit and it's just not a logical place to read a New York Times op-ed on Genius.com lyrics pages. So uh, we thought, it, you know, we thought this was a way... You know, people were already doing this on Twitter. Also, remember when everyone was just starting to screenshot stuff on Twitter? Uh, and that was great. I think around, like, 2014, people yeah, finally figured out you have to pre press, like, the fucking yeah. command, shift, and then four. Which, right. People just learned that. And then we were like, okay, this doesn't seem like the obvious way to, like, talk about stuff. And, you know, we thought this is the way that people who are running around reading and saying critical stuff on the internet, are we're going to give them a better tool for that. And... You know, I'm still plugging away. You know, my favorite thing people do is when they actually take, like, a picture of their phone of the book they're reading that <laughs> they've highlighted. I, I, I like to do that and retweet things in foreign languages to make people follow me think I can, A, read, and B, know foreign languages. Those are the best things to do yeah, I, on there. I, th I think you speak Arabic. I do, yeah. yeah. I'm just retweeting it all. It could say anything, but I just let like, you want people to believe that. It's all about branding. I personally like to take people's 25 tweet tweet storms and retweet every single one, but out of order so that nothing they say makes sense. And then <laughs> people read them and realize it still doesn't. I still don't know how to like thread a tweet. Thing oh, you, like just, you have to reply to yourself. Yeah. I like which is the which I is the you reply to the reply or do you yeah reply yeah you reply to the reply. To the reply oh you reply you reply to the second reply okay it's an art it's like you know what that's like that's like our favorite thing when people would post on forums when uh you would be on game facts off topic the sort of the intellectual salon of the internet yeah. until uh Facebook was invented and you know you'd get into an argument with Wario fourteen eighty eight and. <laughs> He would be like, uh, you're wrong. Bush didn't lie to go into Iraq. And then you would quote his post line by line. Right. right that was right. my favorite. That was oh, the best yeah. thing to do. Yeah. That was, that was like. There was like, remember Fire Joe Morgan? Yeah. Oh. That, that was the same thing. They would just take some sports article and just quote line by line. So, you know, annotation, you know, tale as old as time. It's the, like, right. We've, we've turned this into the most, the most stream. We've synthesized, it's been synthesized into its most streamlined and least insufferable form. The. Quoting the other guy's post line by line being the worst one. I, 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 I do I do admit though that it is funny that I can't annotate tweets, and I think nobody. I think that's too much. Nobody, that's nobody too much is shit. more grateful than Benedict Evans. <laughs> I think I love Ben. I, I love. I, it. I, there should be a platform dedicated to. I him. bet he was a cute little kid. I bet mean, he was adorable. <laughs> he had like these little upside down glasses, yeah, yeah. and he was like, ah, "I want to go to the rum store." <laughs> he lived in the. Then he, he lived with with the Thursleys, and then Hagrid came and got him. Yeah, except except is that his Harry Potter thing? I it, it's very base. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Fucking hell. Oh, wow, I'm falling oh, flat on this interview. Oh, holy shit! Yeah.
Holy shit, you made a fucking Harry Potter joke about Benedict Evans. Yeah, it's original, right? Holy shit. This is... Holy shit. Holy shit. Mark Andreessen <laughs> sort of like listening like, and like hitting his table. Benedict Evans discourse. This is what Hillary did when she met Putin for the first time. This is my, bas- this is how I, I this is my like- basket of deplorables. But I have no idea how I've survived in Silicon Valley just fucking insulting people. I, it's all gonna... I'm definitely like gonna get knifed one day by one of them. I don't know. Like, I, it's like things have worked better for me, like the router that I've been. And I think it's like actually... You know, like, you know how people say have that, like, alpha and beta thing? Yeah. Where they're, like, men are alphas and betas, and that just comes from one study of wolves that, like, some <laughs> asshole did in the 80s, and it proved out not to be true. Wow. It's, like, an incomplete study of, like, social science. <laughs> oh, so it's, like, Maya's Briggs. Actually, they... Yeah. Or vaccines. But <laughs> I think that it's actually subs and doms. And most people are subs, and they want to be... Like, they want to be... Uh, like, you sort of fin-dom other people in the media, i found. Yeah. Well, look, or in Silicon Valley. I find it's useful, like, when I'm criticizing myself and really hard on myself to call myself a beta OCD freak. That's sort of a thing that comes up a lot. I call, my, I'm, call myself a beta cuck to <laughs> confuse my enemies. That's yeah. like exposing your belly and then you pounce. <laughs> yeah, I, I, do, I do admit it is. That is one amazing thing that I think we could all join in on. The has actually been copied by a lot of people now not necessarily from us but you're not it is another internet shift that happened maybe in the last year and a half two years where it's like i suck i'm fucking terrible like <laughs> like it's like a new thing like a new identity thing that people do it's like oh shit well yeah yeah because like okay 2004 you know what was big in 2004 like false bravado yeah and that like all the false bravado guys became the bacon guys ah, i love bacon yeah For the win yeah yeah. And now, like, there is, like, pre workout, there's a come down. And the come down to false bravado is self loathing. Oh, it's true. It's, it is yeah. true. Well, I, th- I think we can wrap up there, though. I think we've, we've managed. At self loathing, yeah. We've managed to, to fix the internet successfully and have off. Our... This felt like a sort of nice cuck support group to me. It was a cuck support, yeah. yeah it was, this was uh, good. I was helping out all, all, the, all the, you know, it depends. How you're raised if you call people cocks, betas, or subs, but any one of those things, it, it was good. It was good for any of those people. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Alan, for coming on. I apologize for you being our first and probably last guest, if anyone listens to this. But C- CJ, CJ was our first guest. Well, yeah, but... It, Holy shit, it really has been two weeks since we've done I this. I know, I know, all right? I know. I go into <laughs> fucking surgery and, like... I know! I go into sur- oh, here he goes with the car accident and surgery card. No, 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 I'm like, I go into surgery, I come back, and I'm just... I'm just like, ah, we've never interviewed anyone. We've interviewed, like, two other people. This is our first show. Yeah, this is actually... Yeah, Scumbag Season 2. Felix gets cucked. <laughs> yeah? I don't know why <laughs> Felix. Felix turns into a sub. <laughs> Ah, it's a change of pace, but... Uh, thank you so much, though, for coming on. Seriously. Thank you, guys. I'm a big Our fan. pleasure. Well, this has, been, this has been Scumbag, episode 10. Sorry for the delay, everyone. We're going to get more regular, and we're so, so grateful that you've been so patient with us. I've been Ed Zitron. I'm Felix Biederman. I'm Elon, the guest. And this is The Scumbag. Thanks for listening. Bye, everybody.